Said, um, pleasure to be here and spend some time with you all today. Thanks for having me, and I commend you all for taking the time out of your Saturdays. I was once in you all's shoes, and I can tell you the last thing I probably would have wanted to do was to spend the majority of my Saturday afternoon back in school. So you should definitely give yourself a clap on the back for that. Um, I guess uh, I'll make this a little bit interactive, hoping that you all can take something away, as well as me to learn a few things from you all. And uh, I guess just by show of hands, who here is in the engineering discipline background? Okay. Majority of folks, and I think we had a law student, right? Yeah. A couple of law students. Okay. Do we have anybody in the business room here? Okay, cool. Did I miss anybody? Natural science. Natural science and mathematics? Okay. Anything in the communications room? Wow. Okay, that's probably one of the ones that you're going to you're going to see a lot of need for, you know, it's one of those things that's supposed to be basic and understood, but I think the key to success in any organization is communication. So I guess uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm not going to try to bore y'all with PowerPoint to death, but I will try to give you a lot of information to help you learn a little bit about the energy industry, at least on the downstream sector. So uh, with that being said, I'll talk a little bit about myself, not much. Uh, we'll talk uh, general about refining, and I'll tell you some specifics about refining and swing, and then we'll talk about re our resilience efforts in, uh, to respond to natural disasters. So if you can think of some natural disasters, we're talking about earthquake, wind, hurricane, tropical storms. That's kind of some of the things that we see on our side, but there's a lot of other natural disasters that you don't see up there. Can anybody think of any natural disasters that you might not see here, but possibly in some other areas of the country? There you go, tsunamis, good. Wind fire. Wind fire, yeah. Ice. Ice, yeah, yeah. those are some really good ones. Can anybody think of anything else? Earthquakes. Earthquakes, good. Okay. So, kind of a uh, more thing mentioned, I'm Chitty Oprum. I, I'm an instrument and controls reliability engineer. I did attend the University of Houston from 2002 to 2006. Um, like you all, I spent my time in a lot of different student organizations. As, uh, we didn't have the energy uh, coalition back then, so it would have been nice to see something like this so we could learn a little bit about the industry prior to going there. So I might not look it, but I've been in the industry for 12 years. Um, I've spent my time in a lot of different work experience from reliability to maintenance planning and scheduling, some uh, process engineering work. How many chemists here? Right? Oh, okay. So we have a good few amount of chemical engineers. Uh, anybody taking process design yet? Well, I guess if you graduated, you probably, probably took it, right? Okay, so, I mean, a lot of that type of stuff that you learn here are things that you apply once you get out into the industry. And then uh, a control systems team lead uh, position, one of the first leadership positions that I held in, um, in, in our refinery. Okay. Right. So, I guess before we get started, does anybody know the difference between upstream and downstream? Can somebody that knows tell me what's the difference? So upstream is about exploration of oil and the drilling of the oil, and downstream is about refining the oil. Easy as put. So that's the most basic thing about uh, the oil and gas industry is what's the difference between upstream and downstream. And I can tell you all when you start going to, is anybody here interviewed or looking for a job or started to talk to companies in the energy industry? Probably so. One of the first questions if they're an integrated oil and gas company is do you want to work upstream or downstream? And I guarantee you sound a little bit better if you have something to say instead of shrug shrugging your shoulders. So kind of as he mentioned, the upstream side is uh, just pulling oil out of the ground. So it's all the energy and the work that it takes to find where oil is located, poke a hole in the ground, and pull it out. All right? Everything on the downstream is refining into usable products. So that's everything from the plastics on your shirt buttons, the gas that you use to put in your car to get here, to the coal that uh, they might use to fire some heaters, and things of that nature. So the main function of a refinery is we take crude oil as a raw product directly out of the ground uh, and we turn it into useful products. Some of the useful products that you'll see, our main, um, our, main, uh, bio, our main product that we produce is gasoline. We make quite a bit of diesel and jet fuel. Then there's a, a bunch of other valuable products that come out of there. So almost any gas that you see probably came out of the ground and was refined from a combination of gases with impurities. Right. So, with that being said, if we start with 
our raw product, which is crude oil. So what is crude oil? So yonder below the earth, right, you have a dirt layer, you have some water layers, you have some uh, other table rock layers, and somewhere in there, there's different areas that you're able to find crude. A whole, uh, just a, 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 a bunch of different facets of crude. So it's just a mixture of hundreds of types of hydrocarbons. So does anybody understand when I say hydrocarbons, what we mean by hydrocarbons? Does anybody remember that, ele you know, the elemental table, table of elements? See, I've been out of school for a while. So, <laughs> right? So it's just a strand that has carbon and hydrogen. You know, different bonds that go with it. There's a bunch of different atoms that come on it, but, you know, they come in different mixes. So that's kind of when we say hydrocarbon. Those are the two things that are the main things. And then each one of them have a different boiling range, right? So if I was to put alcohol in a cup and I boiled it, it would probably boil off pretty quick, right? If I was to put water in a cup, it might take a little bit longer to boil off, right? You know, you can start adding things to it. So when they have these different uh, boiling points, of, you know, you can get gases, you can get liquids from it. And with that being said, you can use the temperature pro property of crude oil to get different products. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. Is everybody following along? Losing anybody yet? Yeah. Okay. We'll go to the next. Okay, so are all crudes alike? Your guess would probably be obviously not, right? So they come with different boiling ranges, different yields, different levels of impurities, different makeups. Um, there's different ways to classify. You can say, you know, one, one side of crude is the sour side. One is the sweet side, depending on the sulfur content and some of the impurities. Has anybody ever seen, heard the word ultra low sulfur, right? Diesel and things of that nature. So that just means that the government has continued to put regulations on, on the amount of sulfur that you can have in your car because you put it in, a, in, a, in an engine, produces NOx, burns off, and then we pollute the environment, right? So the amount of sulfur has severely decreased. 50 years ago, you know, we probably didn't care. <laughs> but the moral that we learn about ozone and uh, our future, right, with the population growth is something that's uh, pretty important. So they all have different mixes, different values. That's fine. So on a typical crude blend that comes in, this is kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing fuel gas, LPGs, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, gas oil, resids, uh, petro coke, and then a bunch of other products. So over here at Sweeney Refinery, this is kind of, for the most part, what we're seeing. So for every barrel of gasoline, that, uh, every barrel of crude that comes in, it has all these different products in there. But as you can guess, they're probably not stacked and layered away for us like that, right? So we've got to do some refining to make it into a usable product. So out of that, we get these percentages, right? So it's weird, you can take a barrel of one product and get more than just a barrel out of it, right? by doing things, and we'll talk about some of the processes that you can do to increase the amount that you get. So wouldn't that be nice if I gave you a gallon of gasoline and you somehow was able to turn it into 1.05 gallons of gasoline, right? And then with that being said, if you see the number makeups here and the percentages, they change over here. So those products that are higher value, we're getting more of those out from what's coming in, right? So there's, you know, there's a lot that goes in there when you start talking about looking at the marketing side. For those people that are here in business, obviously, if you're out there to make money, right, you want to make sure that your raw product that you're purchasing is a whole lot cheaper than, uh, um, excuse me, you want to make sure that the product that you're, uh, that you're creating is a whole lot cheaper than your raw product. So for us on the refining side, as this price goes up, what do you think happens to the end user, right? So that's why oil prices, for the most part, affect us on, on uh, you know, the, the, the cost of a gallon of gasoline at the pump. So, anybody on the marketing side? Anybody on the business side that can help? Okay, can you help us just explain to us the basic dynamics of supply and demand? So, basically, uh, as supply, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an equilibrium point that you want to find between supply and demand that basically defines your price for the product. And uh, when supply goes up and uh, demand goes down, that's when your product prices decrease. And okay. when uh, demand goes up okay. and you know, supply is shorter, mm -hmm. then your prices go up. So she, she explained it just there. When you start asking yourself about the cost of gasoline, I mean, it's a simple marketing principle. However, it gets complicated when you start talking about the cost of gasoline because we have all these variables that go in there. You have OPEC, you have things that are going on in different countries that affect it. You know, you have 
other countries that can, and you know, us, it's a global economy, so everybody can flood the market with as much crude as they want and drive the prices wherever they want, right? There's different things that you start looking at and asking yourself, how complex is the system that I have? Can I ship these products to other markets and make it more valuable than using here in the States, right? right. So, um, don't expect anybody to remember this. This is probably Googleable. But if you start asking yourself, when I showed you that table of some of the products that we make, these are the different boiling points of different products, right? So starting at the top with fuel gas. So for the most part, if you're thinking about a furnace, if you're thinking about uh, running kind of like a gas heater, things of that nature, they, for the most part, use fuel gas. It's a very, very light product. And in fact, it boils. If, if we had some in this room, it would be a gas. It wouldn't be liquid, right? So until you start getting into your straight runs of gas, you see the boiling point for gasoline and naphtha. And then look here, diesel is a whole lot heavier, takes a whole lot more heat to crack it and burn it than it does some of these other products, right? So if you start looking at the very bottom of the barrel, right? So almost like road tar. If you've ever seen, um, I guess, construction companies putting out tar on the road, it almost looks like some little black rocks and there's like a little greasy thing in there. That's directly out of a refinery, right? So it's kind of like, um, you could call it, it's almost like a vacuum reason, but it's just extremely heavy and it probably will not burn in your car if you try to put it in there. All right. So, you know, going into a little bit more detail on the different ways that we uh, classify it. So if you're out there and you're, you know, you're taking marketing classes and you're looking at something in the oil and gas industry, and you're specifically wondering what are some of the characteristics of crude? How do we classify it? Because obviously, if you're buying one crude and you have more of the advantageous products, you should probably be paying more than I am if I'm buying a bunch of trash crude over here, right? So you start looking at the different ways that they characterize it. So if, you know, if there's anybody in here that's in the natural science and mathematics or exploration in it or petroleum engineering, these are the different things that before you poke a hole in the ground, they're sampling. They're looking for, hey, how much value is this product going to be? Before I start spending anywhere in the neighborhood of 100 million plus to poke a hole in the ground, and I'm talking about that's all the legal fees that go with it, that's all the leasing, that's, that's everything that it takes to do the engineering, leasing, and poking a hole in the ground, right? So those are some of the products that you look at. Um, the sulfur content, how heavy is this crude, meaning um, if I was to put it in a pump or put it on the table, is this crude going to run off the table like water or is it going to be like a peanut butter, super thick consistency, right? So if it's easier to use and it's lighter, these, your API gravity is pretty much what's helping direct that. The pour point, so that's how much you can pump it, and then the acidity. So I mean, it's a little bit more detail if we had a bunch of chemical engineers or a bunch of uh, chemists in here. Those would be, I guess, your, 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 your heaven to, to learn some of these products, these properties that make up uh, crude. Right. So, um, as kind of I mentioned, the lighter sweet, the lighter crudes, or kind of sweet crudes is what we call them, they're easier to refine than some of the heavier sour crudes. Which one do you think is probably cheaper? Yeah. Heavy, heavy, right? So the whole intent is, with the facility that you have, what is the harshest crude that you can get, because it's the cheapest, and still be profitable, and not completely wreck all your equipment and tear everything apart, right? So for those, those uh, sites that only have light crude processing capability, if they're not doing upgrades to their metallurgy, if they're not doing upgrades to their processes, they're probably going to go out of business because they're paying X dollars more per barrel of crude than I am, and we're selling it at the same price, right? So those are some of the things that you have to think about when you start talking about what can you do, and things of that nature. Um, I can tell you, uh, I had the date in mind, I can't remember it, but it's been probably 30 plus years since a new refinery was built here in the U.S. It just doesn't happen, right? I mean, the cost, the investment, what it takes to actually invest in a brand new facility just doesn't happen. So what typically happens is you'll see refineries expanding their capability, expanding their capacity, and producing more. So an oil and gas company is going to put investments to make more out of each barrel of gasoline that comes in, look at all the marketing strategies that are necessary to make them more profitable, they're not going to go build another refinery. It just doesn't happen. All right? So 
when we start talking about refining and you know we talked about all these different properties and characteristics that make it up you start asking yourself okay well then how do I break them into all these different uh, um, chemicals and things of that nature so there's probably about six main basic product processes that we use to uh, to pretty much split up the molecules right I said hydrocarbon you can have long strands and chains of hydrocarbons. If I was a chemical engineer or, or a chemistry major, I could draw up the orbital chemistry, all those octagons, and you know, but I'm not. I'm electrical. <laughs> I'm double E, so that's definitely not anything that I want to get into. But in refining, we have something called distillation. So if I had, I just rolled out a thousand marbles on the ground, and they're all different colors, and you have to sort them out. Is that's for the most part what we call distillation. Then there's another one that's called coking or cracking. So if I sit here and I have um, long strands of hydrocarbons, C8, C9, C6s and above, I can break those, those strands and chains up into other products. So it was on the last page, but I had it as, I think it had C4, C3, C6s, etc. So that's just taking your long strands of hydrocarbons and breaking them up, right? Then the next one is rearranging. So now those same thousand marbles are on the ground and I'm saying, eh, I think I want them to bleed red, white, and blue, red, white, and blue. So now you've got to spend all the time to rearrange them and turn them into a certain product. The next one is um, alkylation. So that's just pretty much now recombining. You know, you start to do additives in there. When you start looking at your octane and some of your higher value products, it's because they have alkylation that's going on. So recombining these, right? Purifying. So after we've made gasoline, we say, man, this is good to go, this is good to burn. However, it won't meet government regulations, so you've got to remove the sulfur out of this, right? And then the last one is blending. So typically, uh, has anybody here ever been to, don't ask me why I have this on my mind, but has anybody here ever been to a daiquiri shack? Yeah? Or a uh, icy, a frozen smoothie or anything of that nature? So if you look at the menu, it might have 30 different things that you can buy on there. But if you look in the back, you're like, man, there's only five machines there. Well, they just start blending products, right? So that's the same thing that we're doing over here in refining with molecules, right? So um, kind of as I mentioned, that first step of the process is separation. So I give you this barrel of crude. Now I've got to separate it out into these different um, products. And the first way to separate, how do you think you have, you have to separate it? What do you do to it? You heat it up, right? Remember we talked about the boiling ranges of these different products. So you pretty much heat it up. So it comes in, you literally throw it into a pot. Not a pot, a furnace, but <laughs> you throw it into a, a pot, right? It heats up and then you let it do a naturalish separation in what we call a tower, right? So we'll, we'll get to that here in just a moment. But it's pretty much, we heat it up, we uh, take different straws off and different cuts, and this is very simplified, but that's kind of how you get your main... Um, separation. And then the next one is cracking, so combining. So you're using high pressures, high temperatures. You're using uh, catalytic processes. And it's pretty much what are some of the ways to, what are some of the chemical processes to, to separate a hydrocarbon? Next one is treating, like we talked about, removing sulfur. And then last is blending. So you have this big tank here. So has anybody here ever cooked food in a pot, right? Anybody cook soup or, or anything like that? So you take all these different streams, vegetables, right? You have your carrots here, your onions you cut here, and all that other good stuff. And then at the end of it, you have to blend it all into a pot. So that's how we're getting a lot of our products. The same way a daiquiri shack blends to make all these different drinks that you have. Is everybody following along? Did I lose anybody? Any questions on any of it? No, not yet. OK, on the next slide, uh, OK, we can hit it again. So kind of like I talked about the marbles here, right? So upstream folks have found this uh, and they've got to do a lot of processing on their end before they can even stick it in the pipe put it on a barge um, do any type of shipping of products uh, trucks but now they've given you this product that just has a bunch of marbles in there I think there's a thousand in here I counted it right <laughs> so after we do that we simply we, we literally heat this feed up and then where do you think the heavier product is going to be yeah. right the heavy resin the things that it just refuses to boil off, right? You're heating it, heating it, heating it. It's just refusing to boil off. And then the things that have the super low boiling ranges, those are probably going to be at the at the top, right? So remember when I had the negative X to whatever it was? I think it was negative 149 to to I don't know the coldest things that it take the things that take the, have the lowest boiling point. So now I can take a straw off 
And there are different configurations for what you can do in this tower to help with this separation process. So for the most part, it's natural, but there's a t within these towers, they're packed with trays that allows the liquid to boil up. And then for those pieces that can't make it survival of the finish to the top, they roll over and then you draw off of this tray to get that liquid that, that's pretty much at these different boiling points. All right? So, I mean, kind of similar to what we, we just talked about here. So your crude comes in here, and within this tower, it's operating at 700 to 200 degrees. And this is just a simplified example, right? So the lighter products are up here, the diesels, kerosene, gasoline, excuse me, heavy resid, you're cycling it back in here, still trying to heat it up. And we're taking a draw off of each one of these for further processing, right? All right, so next piece that we mentioned was the purification or the hydro cheating of a product. So we're removing all these impurities. We can't do a whole lot with sulfur, nitrogen, and a lot of other contaminations in our product. However, if I asked you who is the highest consumer of sulfur, what industry would you say it is? Rubber. I'm sorry? Rubber. The, mm, the tires, the rubber industry, for some position of pulver, the, the rubber industry which makes tires. They, they use quite a bit. They use quite a bit. But you'd be surprised. Because y'all probably eat a lot of it. If you get sick. I'm sorry, not for <laughs> no. Pharmacy. The pharmaceutical industry, right? Almost every pill that you know you rub in, you get all this little filmy stuff on your hand, that's sulfur. You know, they're all, they're all, for the most part, sulfur-based drugs. They have some content of sulfur in them. So I'm not a chemical engineer, so I won't even start to talk about this, but this is just pretty much using a catalyst plus heat, adding hydrogen to get a different strand of product over here on this backside. And then what we're taking out, what we're getting out of it is H2S. So we're having sulfur within our product. We're adding catalyst plus hydrogen. What do you think hydrogen likes to bond with? His cousin, sulfur, right? Or, yeah, that didn't sound right. <laughs> hydrogen, <laughs> hydrogen <laughs> likes sulfur. So they combine together to make a product, and this becomes a byproduct. So some of the uh, benefits of doing that is you're reducing, like I mentioned, emissions, you're meeting government regulations. You get a liquid volume gain out of it because sulfur is actually, it combining with uh, your hydrocarbons actually reduces the volume. So this is one of the things that we're doing. And then you recover it to use in other industries. So kind of like I talked about fertilizers, paint, paper, textiles, rubbers, as you mentioned, and in the pharmaceutical business I didn't put up there. But they are really high consumer. All right? So product blending. So now I've taken all these different strands. I've got all these what we call aromatics. You know, you start thinking of gasoline as gasoline as gasoline, but some have higher octane, some of them are Chevron with Tecron, some of them are, you know, they all have their, their, their own product in there. There's different ways to blend. I can stick it all in a tank, right? Or I can stick it all in my pot after I'm done cooking and blend it in the pot. Or I can now take my corn, put it in one corner, take my greens and put it in another corner, and then when it comes to my uh, to table to eat, I'll just mix it all in there and and eat it, right? Or just let it mix in my stomach naturally. So there's a bunch of different ways we can mix within a tank. We can mix by just shooting a bunch of products into one piece of pipe and they naturally mix that way. So um, it just varies on how you want to do it, but blending gasoline, these are some of the different product properties that come in there <coughs> as you're blending. And does anybody know what the natural smell of gasoline is? There you go, right? It, it's actually, we inject a, a, a odor in there so that you can smell it, right? So you don't have a leak and it just looks, or so you're not drinking it thinking it's water. Because, you know, it probably wouldn't be safe. All right? So, you know, does anybody, I guess, general on the downstream side, does anybody have any questions of what do we do? What does an electrical engineer do there? What would a mechanical engineer do there? What would a, a business person with a business background or a legal background do? Actually, can I say something? Sure, here? sure, go ahead. See, what you are seeing today here is an electrical engineer talking about chemical stuff. That's what you'll be doing five years from now, ten years from now. Okay, so, you know, he's, he was not even a specialist in anything that he was talking about. Okay, but that's the whole idea of this multidiscipline project is to give you a flavor of what's going to happen. Now he's going to talk about his own plan. Now we say, what has that got to do with natural disaster? You know, and uh, 
the, the deal here is, why do you want to save the plant? Why do you want to bring it to complete uh, functionality? Because there are, you know, he talked about the profits, right? You're making this so that there are co consumers waiting to consume and build something out of that problem. So it's, you have to understand the economics of it, and you have to understand the chemistry of it, and, and our process side of it, and now so that you can say, if I lose this plant for a day, I'm going to lose X million dollars, not just in revenue. And because I think, the, so this, the chief executive officer of a company is there to make sure that the execution is done right. And the plant manager is there that his execution is done right so that he can produce the product. So these are the pieces that you are talking about. Now we will talk about, so, so you know, uh, those of you who are non-chemical majors, this is like a quick, fresh, uh, a little uh, refresher course. And most of your interviews probably will be either in upstream or midstream or downstream, because most of the, a lot of industry here is oil and gas industry. So, you know, for a, just how impressive it would be if you go start talking about, oh, yeah, yeah, I, you know, the, you know, sweet versus the sour crude, and I think, I don't know how many, about 30 of these plants out of uh, so many of them, and I think they process, you know, heavy crude. And uh, this, this, and I think, how do you know all this stuff? So you see what I'm saying? So I think it's important that I think these slides that you're looking at, you know, I take notes. You know, this is probably, I don't know anybody who's going to ask me any questions about this. But this is a very good set of, so he gave this background, now he's going to get into uh, in the, their plan. And we will be probably meeting with your plan manager somewhere along, mm -hmm. at least technical manager, right? Mm -hmm. So good, I think at least I wanted to kind of bring the reference back, sure. right? Sure. So well, this is important we'll now. Uh, go on. Okay. Kind of like uh, worth mention, you here are working for the most part in your in your um, major. Okay. So if you're a chemical engineer, you work in your box of chemical engineers. If you're electrical engineers, you work in your box of electrical engineers. So to have this opportunity to interact with people from different disciplines. I mean, I went to school here for four years and I never knew what they did in the business field. I just walked by. However, now it's probably very important that I understand a little bit about the business side, right? Understand a little bit about the logistics side, some supply chain management, some uh, commercial aspects of the business to understand how do we remain profitable, right? So um, if you're, whatever your discipline is, expect to work with a bunch of other disciplines, you know, once you get into the workforce because kind of as he was mentioning, everything that I talked about up there, up there I probably couldn't spell half that stuff when I was sitting in you guys' shoes. So anything you can do to leverage yourself and put you just one step ahead of the next person that you're interviewing with, as you start getting into these interview teams and you start talking about some of these opportunities, it makes you far more marketable than the next best person. Right? I mean, everything, that's, all, that's all it is about when you start looking at, man, what do I want to do whenever I graduate? What industry do I want to work in? How do I make myself one step better than the next person so I get the job and they don't. Because it's all, you're, you're literally, even though you're competing within yourself, you're competing with your peer group. And your peer group isn't going to always be the people in your major. I mean, for the type of job that I do, instrument and controls, we have some chemical engineers that do it, we have some electrical engineers, and we have very few mechanical engineers. But, I mean, we're all complete, competing for the same thing. So, to drive it back to how crucial and how important it is when we start talking about 105% of each barrel is kind of the addition that we get. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of put some things into perspective to, so you can see how crucial that number is. So if you look up here, our facility does about 280,000 barrels per day. So I'm going to have somebody help do the math. Kind of, not really. <laughs> but just kind of use these figures in your head. So 280,000 barrels a day of crude. So if we're paying about $100 per barrel, well, no, I'm sorry, 70 dollars per barrel, and you're profitable if you can, after you pay all your bills, you pay all your employees, if you can have a crack spread is what we call it, or margin gain of, say, gasoline, diesel, 
jet fuel, and then a lot of specialty chem chemicals. And the interesting thing is we have a company called Chevron Phillips that we have a joint venture with that's on, you know, we share the same facility. So it's two totally different companies. We drive by each other all day. However, they manage the chemical side of the business and then we're the refining side. So our byproducts, for the most part, we, <coughs> our byproduct is petroleum coke, which is almost like a um, tar. It, I'm sorry, it's not, not necessarily a tar. It's almost, after it's, um, it's turned into coke, it's almost like um, cola, not cola, I'm trying to think of it. Oh. Stuff that you, when you, whenever you put it in your, uh, like if you're barbecuing, Char charcoal. charcoal. Yeah, kept saying coal. It's like charcoal, right? So we've sucked everything we possibly could out of that barrel of gas, and all that's left is charcoal, right? Sulfur is a byproduct. We can't do anything with that, so we do sell it. And then our crude supply, we're getting a lot from Venezuela, but now we've moved into South Texas, Canadian, Mayan. We use a bunch of different crudes now. So it's kind of hard to classify this when Four or five years ago, we, for the most part, had two main suppliers, but over the last 18 months, we probably our diet has been um, 18, 20 plus different crews. So you've got to make sure that your facility can handle it, right? You've got to make sure that your commercial folks working in the corporate office can make those products available to you for a sustained period of time. You start talking about the contracts and the negotiation that goes in it, right? What makes me want to continue shipping person A crew if they only want it for a month at this cost, but person B says, I'll buy it for a year, minimum, right? No matter what the market does, we'll agree on this price. So, I mean, that's what your lawyers and your contract and negotiation folks, that's a lot of the work that they're doing, understanding what is the market doing. Traders are looking at, hey, how much is that barrel costing in a different area? What, what's the actual breakdown of the product in there? So we, um, we have a lot of pipeline around us. We have about 1,000 employees, and somewhere around 850 or so contract personnel that stay on site. And we are about 12,000 acres, and we've actually increased this by uh, buying a bunch of uh, land around us to add what we call fractionation plants. So we'll talk a little bit about fracks, not a whole lot, and like I mentioned, 24-7 uh, operating facility. So if you look at kind of when people are like, man, is it Congo Phillips? Is it Phillips? Is it Congo? What, what, what's going on? Sometimes I don't even remember it, so I drew this chart up here. <laughs> so in 1942, we were built by the government, so it was a government-owned asset. And then um, moving on to 1947, a guy named Frank Phillips and Alamo Refinery, they had a joint venture to purchase it. You move over a couple of years, in 49, Phillips 66 became the prime sole owner of the company, right? So, and, I, and again, I'm just talking about the refining side here. I'll talk a little bit about some of the mergers and acquisitions that we've done. And then we uh, have what we call a cogen. Uh, facility that was a joint venture in 1998. Can anybody think what a cogen facility supplies our refinery with? Steam. There you go. Yep. Electricity and steam. So the thing about it that makes it, I guess, a, a lot more sophisticated than just boiling water and getting steam or, you know, spinning a tur uh, turbine and producing electricity is this one facility does both of them, right? So we create steam by, you know, we have a economizer section, we pretty much boil water to create steam. Well now that we've started boiling it, there's a lot of heat in there that's not doing anything, right? We just exhaust it out. Well you can take that heat that was exhaust and use it to spin a turbine and now you're able to produce electricity. Very complicated to run it, but when they, when they run on all four cylinders, they're, they're really good. So prior to 2000, we didn't have a coker. So that whole bottom piece of that, that uh, big barrel that I showed you, that had vacuum reason, we're able to use that heavy, process that heavy, heavy coke and uh, get more gas out of it. Either by sucking gas out, out of the top or heating it up a little bit more to make it crack. So prior to that, we had to sell that off as a byproduct and facilities that had a coker could be profitable off of it. Now that we have one, we're able to do that. So um, 2000, we, we had the joint venture where um, Chevron Phillips was on our site. We create, they create a lot of plastics and other chemicals so in 2012, or excuse me, 2002, I'll back up a little bit more and talk a little bit more in general about the company. So Phillips is a combination of a couple of Phillips 66 plants, a couple of Tosco plants, a couple of Unical plants. So I mean, there's all these small refining companies and Phillips 66, Frank Phillips and his uh, goons, no, 
Frank Phillips and his folks, they went and, and purchased all these refineries, right? So we have Phillips 66. Well, on the Conoco side, they were doing the same thing. So in 2002, Conoco and Phillips merged together and became Conoco Phillips, right? So that was good. And, um, uh, and let me back up. Conoco also was an upstream facility. So they had a couple of upstream processing facilities. Then in 2012, they thought, man, maybe we didn't want to do that, right? So then we have what we call the spinoff. So Conoco Phillips, kind of the mother company, remained just upstream. And then uh, Phillips 66 in May of 2012 became just a solely downstream company, right? Which, I mean, it was advantageous to us on the downstream <coughs> side because shortly after that, does anybody know what happened to the market in 2014? Oil right? prices went from $100 to like $40. I mean, what do you do when you've got contracts in place and you've already spent billions of dollars to invest in poking holes in the ground and now the product that you were planning on making $100 steady is now $40? I can tell you what they did. They stopped poking holes in the ground, right? They stopped hiring. They stopped picking up folks here. Um, the market became a whole lot more competitive. You know, you had to trim a lot of fat. You start thinking of um, all the Trump, man, they couldn't, from two, about 2008 to 2013, for every, for every engineer, and especially petroleum engineer that was out there, competent and well-trained, there's probably five jobs. I mean, they, you couldn't get enough petroleum engineers. About 2015, 2016, for every job out there, there's 10 engineers, right? There just really aren't enough jobs. You know, you, you've got to continue to manage your business in a way that's, that, that makes sense. I hope I didn't scare anybody. Nobody's petroleum engineer, right? <laughs> I was just kidding about the last statement. <laughs> None of that stuff is true, right? So um, we spun off in 20, 2012, and that's kind of where we're at. Does anybody have any questions about this confusing flow of how we... I probably missed it, but what does the term mothballed mean? Uh, 1945, you said the facility mothballed. Oh, I'm sorry. So the government owned it in 42, mm -hmm. and then mothballers just shut it down. We're not running anything here. The war is over. We don't need any jet. And it was primarily used for just jet fuel. Okay. And it, interesting that you said that. So we had a facility. So we had 13 facilities in the States and four overseas or three overseas. And then one of our facilities in uh, Philadelphia was our trainer facility. We, moth we were going to mothball it, but we actually found a buyer. So we just sold that off and it was just hard to be profitable you know the cost to get product up there you start looking at some of the competition that they have on the northeast coast you'd be surprised on how many refineries are on that northeast coast and then most importantly uh, yeah they just couldn't make money so for years kind of like I mentioned they're always at a negative profit so um, shutting the facility down and looking at mothballing it what can you get you know talking you know all the business folks that jump in there what we ended up doing was selling it to Delta Airlines so they own that facility now and guess what they use it for Jet fuel, right? And everything else is for the most part a byproduct and they can send it somewhere else or they can just ship it on the market that's a pipeline. So they found a way for it to be profitable for them, right? Alright, thanks. So, does anybody live over here in Pearland area? Like 288? No? Okay. So where our facility is actually at, it sounds like it's forever and a day away which it feels like it is sometimes. <laughs> so this is Sweeney Refinery, so I, I guess I should have blew this up a little bit more, but Houston is just up here north a little bit. And I actually live, well, you can't see it up there either, but I live in Richmond Rosenberg, just south of Sugar Land. So it takes me about 40 to 42 minutes, miles, um, each day, you know, one way, which sounds bad the first year you do it, <laughs> you know, first few months. But when you start to compare it to sitting in some of the traffic in Houston, I'll take that drive nine times over ten <laughs> and sitting in Houston's traffic. How's parking been at U of H, by the way? <laughs> it's gotten worse. Damn. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all a perspective on that. When I was here, there was no parking garage. So when I come here and there's all these parking garages, I'm like, damn, they must park wherever. They, everybody must have their own parking spot designated <laughs> for them. But then I hear it's bad. How's it bad? Uh, they tripled the amount of students. <laughs> they tripled the amount of students. I, I, I could probably believe that. So anyhow, so my drive, it's about, and when you really think of it, if you had a bird's eye view from Houston, it's probably about 50 miles directly over Houston, but you can't. So the actual way to get to Houston, if you're going to Houston is, we probably take 35 over here, and you get into town, has anybody heard of Angleton? Angleton, and you take 288 north. So there's not any traffic going through there, but it is probably right at 60 miles to get there. So that's the facility. We have what we call a San Bernard Terminal, Clemens Terminal. Does anybody know what uh, caverns are? Natural caverns? 
so I'm just gonna that. There's gotta be a chemical engineer in here that knows it, right? So a cavern is pretty much just a salt doom under the ground, right? It's just a hole in the ground that's naturally hardened and we can put product down there, right? Um, so that's for the most part what the chemical uh, chemical side does, uses. And then there's Freeport Facility and Jones Creek. So the majority of our product comes in over here to Freeport. They do some light processing of it to get it ready to work in a refinery, and then it literally goes through a bunch of pipes, probably about 25 miles of pipe to get to Smithy. And then we start processing. Excuse me, we drop it in a tank, and then we start processing it out of the tank. And there's a lot of reasons why we drop product into a tank. Sometimes there's literally sand, high sulfur content, a bunch of impurities, solids. You want those things to drop out before you start just running them through your, your towers and stuff and start tearing up catalysts, right? All right. So we received, uh, like I said, there was a time the majority of our uh, crew was Venezuela and um, Shell, but now we receive it all over the country. You know, a lot of our product now comes through Canada. We still get a lot out of the coast. Um, some over here from South America. We have Maya crew. I mean, there's crew exported to us all over the place. And what's interesting, when I visited our trading floor a couple years ago, there might be a barge of crew coming from, let's say, South America. It might trade 10, 20 different times before it actually lands somewhere, right? So I buy the crude, and it's coming over here out of Ecuador, wherever it's at, right? I sell it as it's traveling. Somebody else on the trading market is like, man, we'll buy that. They sell it. So that's how the whole trading business goes to where when it finally lands over here, it's like, all right, well, who owns it? So it's almost like a hot potato, right? You're going to lose a lot by, you know, what you're looking at the market conditions. You can gain a lot. So that's kind of where the trading side goes. Does anybody want to go into trading? And it can be high stress, but it's one of those things, uh, high risk, high reward, you know? I mean, they're, they're compensated very well. However, I mean, you lose a couple million dollars on a, on, in a day deal, I mean, it, it starts to feel a little bit stressful, right? <laughs> <laughs> literally, and I'm, I'm saying literally millions of dollars a day that are lost. And it's all, to me, it's, it's, it's like cryptocurrency. It's fake money, right? <laughs> all right, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the equipment that we have in refineries. Um, if you were to visit the facility, you'd be able to see this. <clears throat> so we're still trying to set that up, but from a distance, you see all these tall towers. Has anybody drove by a plant, I mean, you might not be able to tell, but what you see from the distance is a bunch of towers, and what's going on in there is they're, for the most part, separating products. Inside of them, it's not like a hollow tower, usually they're packed with different trays, so that you're able to draw a product off of these different boiling points, right? We have something called reactors, so they look like towers, except they're wide, they're big, they get really hot, kind of high pressure, and you're usually dropping a bunch of catalysts in there that speeds up a natural process, right? So let's say that um, normally it takes me an hour to cook my eggs. So now I drop some type of catalyst in there, boom, two minutes later my eggs are cooked, right? That can be very profitable for anybody. <coughs> There's furnaces and heat exchangers. So now the furnaces uh, that we're talking about, we have furnaces that are as cold as 300 degrees, and then our coker furnaces gets temperatures up to about 14, 1500 degrees. So it's probably kind of hot, you don't want to stick your fingers in there. So, um, and then before I go on to this, I'll ask a real quick question. What are the three items needed to start a fire? Or to have a furnace stay lit? Oxygen, it's called the fire triangle. Uh -huh. Oxygen. Um, you got one? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, just, I have it in my head. Uh, hey, my mate, I bet you know it. I'm sure everybody here has started a fire before. Ignition source. Okay, you have to have heat, ignition source, oxygen, and what's the next one? Hydrocarbons. You have to have some type of fuel source, right? If you don't, if you take out any one of those three, then you no longer have a fire, right? So there's different types, you know, we're getting a little bit off track, but I want you to learn a little bit about furnaces. There's different types of ways to um, take a furnace out. Some of them are starving it by oxygen. Some of them are putting water in there to take out the heat source. You know, there, there's a lot of different ways. Um, and then obviously we have lots of valves, pipes, pumps, compressors. So as we're processing things, we're trying to get higher pressure of uh, liquids and gases. We throw them through compressors, valves, or controlling items to, to allow flow of products. All right. 
So I won't even try to explain all this, but to give you an idea of where these products go and what they're for the most part used on that tower that I showed that split, obviously everything at the very top are going to be gases, right? You drop them and poof, it's a gas. You know, I, there's no way I can pour methane into a cup in here because it probably won't happen. So those are automatically gases. There's LPGs. You might see as you're driving down the road some of these, um, these big tankers. And then you might see something that says LPG in there. Well, pretty much you're just liquefying the gases. So you're compressing it to where it turns into a liquid. Because there's different ways to, you know, obviously gases have higher pressure. The molecules are moving around a whole lot. You compress it, keep it liquefied. There's things that you can do with it. There's naphtha, kerosene, gasoline, diesel, gas oil, all these different strands. It goes through. These are the different types of units that they go through to get these type of products out here, right? So what, the gases that we have are used to burn as refinery fuel. So these heaters are staying lit all day long. We have propane that we actually sell. There's gasoline, jet fuel, kerosene, ab gas, and so forth. Diesel, you know, one of the heavier products. All right. So our feedstock, as I mentioned, um, comes from a bunch of different ways. I won't go into too much detail on this. But then our, our products that we actually make, and this is why when we start talking about our resilience efforts, why it's going to be important. We have direct access to everybody that uses this market right here called the Pasadena Terminal, right? We have direct access over here to um, Freeport. So you start looking at supply, demand, you know, it's cheaper for us to get product out than it is for somebody sitting here in the Midwest probably, right? So that's where you start looking at ways that we can be advantageous, right? So what are some of the natural disasters that could affect refining? We talked about that a little bit earlier, so we're switching gears. So we talked a little bit about refinery, refineries and a uh, Sweeney facility. Now I want this piece to be a little bit interactive because, as I understand, you all have a project to work with different groups on. So the most common one we have here, I feel like if you spit, it floods, right? <laughs> I mean, there's, we have flooding, and you know, if you've has anybody here been to New Orleans? I feel like it's ten times worse there. First of all, it rains forever, and then when it's done raining, the streets just they don't have really good pump pump systems that can keep water out of the streets. So we'll talk about how that can affect us over here in refining. There's tropical storms, hurricanes, one that we don't have to worry about. But is everybody here? Does everybody here plan to work in Houston whenever they graduate? Even if you plan to, you might not know where you'll end up at. You know, you might end up at a West Coast facility where they've got a plan against earthquakes. You know, so it's not just these items that we have. There's tornadoes, natural fires, and droughts. Does anybody remember probably towards the fall of last year, all those fires that were in, or not fall, it was actually, I think, it was that January? That was just this year. January, February. It's like, is this real, right? <laughs> Wildfires, like how, how does that happen? It, it's hard for us to envision that much fire just starting and burning down acres and acres and acres of land, but those folks over there are like, man, I can't move the Houston. The other guys have hurricanes, right? So you start looking at some of the different natural disasters that uh, folks have to be resilient against. And then there's droughts. I'll talk a little bit about how drought can really, really harm not just a refinery, <clears throat> but anybody that needs water. Can anybody think of why we would need water in a refinery? To cool, to cool, to cool things down. Exactly, right? It so generate the steam. Yep, we use water to heat stuff up, to cool stuff down, to run a lot of processes. We, we consume quite a bit of steam. We can consume quite a bit of steam in our facility to run turbines. You know, anything that's spinning has the ability to use steam as its, as its energy source, right? And then we've got to cool our products down. We have what we call a heat exchanger. Can anybody explain how a heat exchanger might work? Sure. There's a heating steam and there's cooling steam and it's exchanged through by contact or by through exchange of material. Yeah. Good. I mean, it pretty much explained it. So you have a, a vessel, what we call an exchanger. And within that exchanger, there's a bunch of tubes in there, right? So the way that you, it's literally the most efficient means of heat exchange, you're running a product through that you want to heat up, and you have a hot product that you want to cool down. So you just kind of let those come in contact with each other. And now I get my, well, if I started hot here, I get cold. If I get cold there, start, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? We just let these two products come into contact. So that's how you kind of conserve, because the biggest, the way that you make, when I talked about nobody's building new facilities, they're just making theirs more efficient, producing more. 
there's things like that that you have to think of. Well, this product that's hot, then I don't need it to be this hot. I've got to find a way to capture that heat, right? All right. So, what do we have to be resilient? Why, why do we need resilience against some natural disasters? They make major disruptions in the energy sector. We're still recovering from Hurricane Ike. You'd be surprised by, within the U.S., they have a rating for how much product is available, how many refined products are available to ship out. That supply line went down. Was anybody here during Ike, Rita, or Harvey? Yeah. When you came back to Houston, how easy was it to get gas? I found it interesting. I was in San Antonio, so I couldn't come back in. Mm -hmm. and there was like no gasoline anywhere yeah. in San Antonio either. So oh, I believe it. Yeah. Here we So number one, it takes people being there to be able to sell you gas, and number two, there has to be product available, you know. And even if product is available, it has to be a means to ship it out. So it's not just like, oh, I shut down, but hey, we'll, we'll get you product tomorrow. And we'll talk a little bit about the efforts that it takes to shut down, to start back up, and what you need to do um, to be ready for this. So facilities that are best prepared to restart and provide energy far quicker than those that have not done the, the uh, preparation. So kind of as a wise guy once told me, I like to plan twice or measure twice and cut once, right? Have you ever had something that you needed to cut or, or do anything with and you didn't measure it twice and you cut it too small, oh man, it doesn't fit now, right? So that's the importance of plan, 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 and then work your plan as opposed to jump into things without a plan. So um, the biggest thing when you start getting into manufacturing facilities, operations excellence. What does operations excellence mean? It means just keeping your focus on your facility. When I talked about a 24-7 operation that you don't ever want to, you don't want it to shut down unexpectedly, right? You know, if a pump goes down or a compressor goes down or a piece of equipment goes down, it can be crucial to the, to the, um, to, to just the, the, the makeup of your plant. So the times that you have to have the most operational excellence are probably when you shut down, when you start up, and when you have abnormal situations, right? Oh man, they told us this crew had this product in there, but it's a whole lot heavier than we thought it would. Now our unit is downstream or pressuring up. We can't have this tower at this pressure because that tower is only rated for 20 pounds of pressure, and now we have 60 pounds of pressure in there. What happens when that, when that happens? You start having catastrophic failure. You start having drums unzip, which is, which is never a good thing. All right, um, so again, you know, just the focus on that is preparation of the best resilience towards natural disasters. So it's not necessarily about what you're doing during the natural disaster. Where you really see your work paying off is how much preparation you've done. And we'll talk, that's the main focus of kind of what can you do to be more resilient resilient in uh, natural disasters, all right? So what does preparation entail? We'll talk about some of these, and then if you all can think of some, I want you all to just kind of add that to your mind as you start thinking about what your project is going to consume. So your number one thing is physical barriers, right? We have floodgates. So how many times do you think we've had a building flood that we didn't need to have water in, right? You start looking at some of your electronics, some of your controls equipment, some of your networking equipment that's at this level, when that water gets up in there and starts tearing up your equipment, the first thing you do is, well, how do we keep the water out? We have a cinder block building. Well, we have areas that we have floodgates. And it's, it's literally that. You know, We have the ability to just pull gates out, bolt them on. They have gaskets in them. So instead of my roof flooding at you know two foot above ground, now it takes that water, has to get up three and four feet around up top, right? So that's a very temporary means of controlling water, but there's things like that that we do. Um, we can build dams. We have that in our facility. And sandbags. Someone said sandbags. Why, why would you need sandbags? It's interesting how strong sand can be and how much it can work in your favor. You start sandbagging around your house, around your house or around a door. Um, when water runs down, it, it takes a whole lot more for water to make its way through sand onto the other side than it does to make its way through, say, air. Right. Okay, so the next one is your infrastructure needs. So there's buildings that I've walked in and I'm like, man, all of our networking equipment was in here. Now this area is just empty or it's just a sitting or conference area. But now we have a stairway that leads to another building up top. Well, the modulated building. So these are all some lessons learned where you're like, man, <coughs> it's cheaper. 
I don't have to go through as much environmental thinking about to build a building on top of this or to drop a building on top of here that's now out of the floodplains, right? <coughs> so we also have heightened building. There's a lot of projects that we have in expansion going in to what we call is almost, if you can think of substations or facilities that you keep a lot of your control equipment where there's a time where the minimum, where you could, you know, you examine your area and it's like, okay, we want that three feet above sea level. Well, now I'm seeing a lot of our controls equipment that's coming in and our buildings are now six feet above, right? I'm like, man, that kind of looks awkward, but I guess. Well, it's, it's so advantageous when you start to have some of these situations and things that ha happen. Does anybody, does anybody know what a retention pond, is there any civil engineers in here? No, no civil, okay. So does anybody understand the idea of a retention pond? Which can bypass many water. It's exactly that, right? So I have my house here, and um, I don't want my house to flood, but I've got a couple acres over here on the side. So once I start to get that heavy rainfall, I've learned that I can pump all that water over here and it'll sit in that pond until the sun shines out and takes all the water away, right? So <clears throat> the next thing that we have is uh, built for earthquake infrastructure. You know, if there are some civil engineers here, um, this is an interesting one because we had what we call as our ultra low sulfur diesel plant that was built back in 2005. When that facility was built, it was built with a uh, high rated structure for earthquakes. But, well, we don't have earthquakes here. That doesn't seem like it makes a lick of sense because the cost associated with that is incredible. However, the company that designed that facility designed it for three of our plants. So it was a cookie cutter. As you can imagine, two of them were in the West Coast, right? So this cookie cutter plant was used to and they probably got some super deal because it was a cookie cutter. It was used to uh, build our facility. Well, now we have this high intense infrastructure that we don't necessarily need. But if you're on the West Coast, that's probably more important than floodgates. They don't care about floodgates, right? Can anybody think of any other infrastructure or barriers that might help you in any type of these natural disasters we talked about? Can we cover them all? Anything? Okay, so the last things that I have over here are deluge systems. Once a fire started and you've done everything you could to not have a fire, the fire is there. What can you now do? You can extinguish the fire. So we have deluge systems on a lot of our, a lot of our tanks and areas that are susceptible to any type of fire issue. So what can you do to make yourself resilient against a drought? I don't know if a lot of people remember this, but back in about 2011, we, the Houston area, we pretty much had a drought. Right? We have miles of acres worth of what we call reservoirs right? that we have the rights to. So nobody can go pull the water out of there except you know, our facility, our site. We have the environmental rights to do it on these reservoirs. Big hole in the ground. I'm talking about the hole in the ground is from, I don't even know the building names, let me not try, but <laughs> Bruce A, what is it, Bruce A something center. The religion center. From there probably over to the engineering building. I mean, it's probably that long by that wide. I mean, we consume a lot of water, a lot of water. I'm talking about we use thousands of gallons per minute of water. I mean, you have to flush the toilet. It's potable. <laughs> Drink out of it if you want. Um, we use it for a lot of our heat exchange, boiling stuff, <coughs> and cooling down. We use a lot, a lot of water, so we've got to have a lot of reservoir worth of water. So our typical normal day-to-day -day run is about 60 to 70 days of water available, meaning if it stopped raining today, we'd have 60 to 70 days that our facility could still run <coughs> with the amount left. We've never done this until 2011. We got down to 14 days. You know how scary that is? <laughs> and water doesn't just come out of nowhere. Really. If you don't have it, you just don't have it. All right? So, um, yeah, so that's on the water side. Those are some of the things that you have to do. So the environmental regulations that it takes, everything that it takes to have the rights to drill in there. So we have a lot of our uh, legal team that works that side. All right. Next one you can think of is your network and your utilities. So a lot of our control systems are either there's a lot of programming that takes place to run these facilities, there's a lot of information on there. You know, you start thinking of how is this program, what are the engineering documents behind it? We have hard copies of items. We have electronic copies, we have remote backups that go off-site into Houston. We have remote backups that go underground into different places. And this was, if we were to suffer some type of cyber attack, or if we were to just lose all the computers at our site, 
how, how do we get started here? So managing this right here, and at some point we'll probably get into the cloud. All right, does anybody understand right. very old conservative industry that takes, we're always behind the trend. Everybody, you know, wireless was all over the place before we started moving into wireless. But start thinking of what are some things that you can do with the cloud capability to back up some of your information. Sure, go ahead. Do y'all already use VPN for remote access during emergencies? I'm sorry? We do y'all do. Do already use like a VPN service? Mm -hmm. for yeah, we do. Okay, so is that, how frequent is operator intervention like necessary or how much can be done? Okay, so with that VPN, there's different levels of, you know, network, there's firewalls. But once we get it through a firewall, we're able to VPN onto what we call our business network. So we can't do anything on the control side. <laughs> so I mean, there, there's a separation because we don't want people on the control side because you can inflict viruses, you can do malicious acts that could be probably not that good. I mean, there, there's terrorist acts that you can do with that. There's a lot that goes on with allowing people onto your control network. But we can get onto what we call our intranet. Uh, are y'all hardwired in or? No, no it's okay. not. It's all wireless at that point, just that piece. But as far as cloud and things of that nature, we're not there yet, but <clears throat> there's some of the uh, services companies um, that, like for instance, a GE, one of the biggest things that they're trying to do is they're trying to manage this whole side of people by using the cloud, right? Got to make it safe. You don't want your stuff on there that you don't need other people seeing, right? Uh, redundant networks. So you start thinking of, man, I had this server and router going, now it crashed. How does my facility have to crash? No, I have a redundant backup on it, right? So redundant and remote communications. So we have satellite communications, we have satellite phones, we have uh, remote communications. So we have a hotel out in, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the town, but it's like halfway in between here and Austin. And if something was to happen to our facility, we're able to connect to our corporate folks, we can still communicate and do everything that we could based on this. Redundant utilities for critical systems. So let's say that we have a natural disaster coming and we've got to shut everything down. <clears throat> One of the biggest things that, you know, that a facility needs is steam. If you shut down your steam, and I'll tell you, so our steam runs at about um, 650 pounds of pressure is what we have. So we're talking about a couple hundred, hundred uh, degrees of superheated steam. What happens to steam when you leave it in the line without it still running or being hot? It turns into what? Water, right? How good do you think it is to have water running where you expect steam? Probably not that good. A terrible bunch of equipment. It takes a while to heat up these lines so that you're able to have steam again. So there's different things that you can do to have redundant steam supply. There's things that we've done. You know, one of the lessons that we've learned back in 20. 13, we came down, I'm trying to remember which one of these storms it was. But we came down, we were ready to start up, everything was good to go, however, our steam was cold. So we had to sit around and wait four days for the steam header to heat up hot enough to we could process it. Which, eh, you know, like, ah, oh, four days, you know, we'll get there. Do you know the dollars lost in that four days for not having the ability to keep our steam hot? So <coughs> what we have is, and that's because we lost power. Once we lost power to the site, um, some of our, our uh, electric motors and blowers to start up the equipment we couldn't start it up till we had power. And then when we finally got power, our steam was all wet, right? So now we had to heat up all this steam. So now we found a way to pretty much use like a, a auxiliary amount of steam to just keep the header hot. I and mean, that's one of the lessons that we've learned is how do you take your existing facilities, right, and your existing utilities how do you take those and ensure that you can start up quicker? Because, you know, days turns to dollars. And then the last thing is cybersecurity. Having cyber cybersecurity at your site, what that means to you, you know what I mean? Um, being susceptible to natural disasters that come. Let's say I'm, I'm a refining nerd and now I want to, you know, uh, now I want to participate in some malicious behavior. Well, I have all the electronics and the passwords to get onto their system. I can walk by and I can start starting the stopping equipment because they put everything on wireless and there's no firewall. I can get into their control network and things of that nature. How crucial do you think that is to the operation and, and staying resilient against natural disasters? All right? So the next one that we have is logistics, and this is a major one. There's, there's probably nothing more important in planning than the logistics that go in there. So, Remote location setup. 
one of the things that we've learned over the last 15 years is, man, whenever we have an issue that comes here, we probably need to have a remote facility so that we can still operate. Because there's more than just what's physically happening at the plant. There's the management, there's the oversight, there's the communication. So we have lodging, like I was mentioning, we have multiple places. We have Angleton, we have a, a spot in between here and Austin. I just can't think of the name of the city. And what we have is we literally pay a yearly fee so that if there ever was a storm, they have to save X amount of room just for Phillips 66, right? There's transportation to get there. Back in a flood in the 80s, can't remember the exact year, 80s or 90s, one of my old bosses, he said that they had the, uh, because the government, I mean, they needed gasoline, he was at home, but he couldn't get from his house to the facility. So they literally had fire trucks and boats go get him so that he could come and help get the electrical infrastructure back on. So if you didn't plan for that, and, and now you're searching around for boats, that probably won't happen, you know? So these are some of the logistical things that um, make you more resilient towards natural disasters, right? And don't think of these one-off situations. Kind of think of it holistically. Man, what are some of the needs that I have to get people moving around? So <laughs> that if we have these natural disasters, we can still have communication. Another good example of this, I don't have it up there on the communication side is, over the years I've seen us kind of change in where communication was. Not everybody had a cell phone back in the days. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, any time that we had a hurricane, some high tornadoes, or things that we said, we only want our critical folks at the plant. Everybody has a day off. You have to call into this 1-800 number. How many people remember that 1-800 number? Of course, every year they gave you the little magnets, and you're supposed to put it on your fridge. But you know, it's like, hey, do we go in? Well, I'm not sure. Who do I call? Nobody's called me. Have you, called? You, you see how that can be an issue? So start thinking of with social media you know, with web-based applications, cell phones, some of the things that you're able to do. So now we're at the point where if you have your phone number onto our uh, company directory, which you should, now you get an automatic call. Hey, this is just an update on this. Please call in during this time. But I bet we can take that one step further in the day and age that we are, right? So I'll let you all keep that in mind as you start thinking of when we have natural disasters, what can we do for this? The next one, uh, spare parts management, right? There's some, <laughs> there's some pumps that we have, some turbines that have, let me back up. So for the most part, a turbine has what we call a stator and a rotor. The stator is the kind of the part that sits, sits still, pretty much just the long piece, and then the rotor is the piece that's spinning around it. Sometimes that stator can cost several million dollars, several million dollars. So then you're like, man, I should have a spare one because if it breaks, it's going to take 50 weeks, 60 weeks to build one. Do you want your facility down for 60 weeks at a time? Probably not, right? So you start thinking of that, but you, can, you probably can't get to the point, thank you. You probably can't get to the point that you can have a spare rotor for every single pump that you have. So then it becomes a game of your risk management. How risk adverse do you want to be to this? How resilient do you want to be? Because at the end of the day, you can build a spare refinery, right? So now <laughs> you, you'll never have to worry about anything. But you got to run a business, right? You got to, you know, our business is a business of risks. How much financial risk, how much legal risk are we willing to take? <coughs> and then pipeline right away. So everybody comes down during Hurricane Harvey, right? A week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, now everybody's ready to come up. They've got all this product sitting on their facility that they've got to ship into the pipeline. Can everybody ship at once? Probably not, right? So you start securing these right of ways so that you have the right. And ways to do that is by build your own pipe, right? Get a midstream organization that goes in there <coughs> and lay pipe all over the place. Charge the next best company X amount of dollars to ship product through that pipe, right? But you have to decide how much pipe do I want to own, how much do I want to lease, how much do I want to sell. I mean, these are some of the coordination and logistical efforts and things that you have to be to stay strong th throughout these, some of these natural disasters. All right, <clears throat> now, uh, one of the last ones here is the startup and recovery plan, right? So uh, a, a natural disaster is coming through. You see it on the news for a month straight, not a month. You probably get a week. They're like, oh, here we go. It's a, what is it, level two tornado or what is it called? Category, Category two, <laughs> sorry. Category two tornado. Category three, oh, never mind. It turned this way up. Oh, you know what? It's really coming. If you don't have it already set in stone, on who's going to sit at the plant all day and make sure that your crucial um, processes remain in operation or shut down. If you don't have that plant in place, you're up a creek, right? 
<coughs> and then after that, when you say we're only keeping X essential people on site, you start thinking of now we need a first response crew. We need to assess the damages. We need to assess the needs. If you haven't planned this, don't have this plan on paper, you're probably up a creek as well. Sure, go ahead. Is there a typical size for ride out crew and for assessment crew that you sure. would have on top of your head? Sure. So at our facility, for the most part, on a ride out crew, they'll keep like one crew. So like a foreman and then a, cra a group of craftspeople. So like if you have an electrician, there'll probably be one foreman and four electricians. If you have pipe fitters, maybe one foreman, six pipe fitters. And where it gets interesting is we also have a bunch of contractors, right? So we ask some of these contract companies, we need to have X amount of people during this time, right? So it gets really interesting where your normal instrument response crew could be 50 people. Well, we want to make sure we keep at least four on site, six on site. So I mean, it's, it's a very small amount of people, but you need to have that. So we'll talk a little bit more about, um, and then that's a really good question. And then you have a first response, right? Go ahead. It, um, so the, will you be here the rest of, you know, all through till 4 o'clock? No, probably not quite till 4. You want me to start wrapping it up? No, it's m mostly if they have some questions. See, you're going through a very important part here, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you had, say, let's say, two, three areas where the students can be, uh, helping you out. Please, sure. Right? Uh -huh. I think, is there a way you can kind of mention those? And I think we are actually, we have two more lectures. Right? Okay. After this. So, if you can, if you can f uh, also explain those things, sure. you're not going to be here sure, after sure, this. Sure, sure, uh -huh. sure. That'll be helpful. Okay. okay. And maybe another, what, how many, 10 minutes? No, uh, there's probably two more slides left. Okay. There. Actually, there's one more slide. Okay. So, if you can, uh, you know, and I think, don't be, see, it's very difficult to get Chidi back here into the room, <laughs> right? So that I think you should ask the questions. And I think if you, you know, see the typically if you say hey one or two areas, this will be very helpful for sure, us, sure. for you guys to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. And this is the data that we can give you. So one question that I asked you was between Rita, Katrina, Ike, and Harvey, mm -hmm. and things that you said you would like to do. Sure. And some of them I'm sure you did not do, right? Yeah. yeah. So is there anything with the new technology that these guys can be proposing to you? Sure. Kind of say, and then do some cost benefits and things like that. Sure. And I'm expecting there'll be some offshoots of this project after this project, this phase is over. Sure, sure, so. sure. I think, uh, and that's a good catch, I think the whole cloud base and, uh, and kind of social media aspect, how do you use that how do you use cloud-based business plus social media for communication and quicker startup, right? Do you develop an app? You know what I mean? Do you talk about the cost associated with not being able to reach people? And then, if any, was anybody here during Hurricane Ike? So I was here, no, not was it Ike or whichever one was in 2005. I was here at U of H, Rita. I was here on, on campus at U of H. I started hearing, I was like, man, they, they're shutting down class. They never do that. What the heck is going on? I was like, let me let me call my buddies and see what's going on. Get on the phone. Doo, doo. Nobody can make a phone call. <laughs> right? So you start thinking of, is there an app that I can develop that doesn't use the phone network to communicate with people? Can I find ways to use Bluetooth communication? Can I find ways to use satellite communication? Right? How, how do I communicate with those during these disasters to ensure that we're able to, I mean, communicate? To me, that's key. So I think that's probably one of the stronger areas that you can utilize. And then you start talking, you know, back on the startup and recovery. So then on the lodging and the food. So during Hurricane Harvey just recently, one of the things that we had was we had a ride out crew. And this was the piece that we, I guess we've learned because I've never seen this. They had pallets and pallets and pallets and pallets and pallets of food. And I was like, why is it every hallway had food? And I'm like, you know. <laughs> It wasn't that great food, but they had food, you know, before some of the cafes could open back up to start, you know, delivering food to us. I said, man, how did this food get here? I was like, oh, they dropped it in by helicopter. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, our commercial folks somehow were able to run around, secure this, and they dropped a bunch of food pallets in on the other side of it. Because nobody could drive into the facility. There was water everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So you start thinking of that, which we didn't ever think of that. It's thank goodness our company was able to secure that, but start thinking of how, so those are the two things, the communication, 
cloud-based item, and the second one is how do we how do we uh, manage our first response and write-out crews, right? How do we make sure that they have food in there? Do we get contracts set in place? And then they were there for days. The first write-out crew was there for nine days or eight days. So then we had this, it was funny, it was, a, it was called the rubber ducky, but what it was was a, a mobile shower, which I thought was pretty neat, you know. So what is this, literally a big rubber ducky over here? Oh, oh it's a mobile shower. I would have never thought about that, right? So we have to start getting more and more particular about how we lodge and provide food for, um, for those that are staying on site. Critical system analysis, so like we talked about, valuing your spare needs, and then environmental support. You know, before you start up, you want to make sure that you're not letting things out of the pipe that you don't need out of the pipe. So having the monitoring, communicating with the EPA, TCEQ, and different reporting agencies. Alright? And we've come to an end. So, we talked briefly about some of the lessons that we did learn at that area. Does anybody have any questions on any, any specific? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering whether, as a company, do you have like records of um, what the personnel did during emergencies, like every single emergency? Mm -hmm. Do you guys keep track of that? Okay. And like, what you exactly do yeah. so that you can improve mm -hmm. after that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, that's a good thing. Lessons learned, if they're not documented, they ain't learned. <laughs> right? Because that, that's another thing. Documentation, you talk to one person, they're like, oh, find it on a share drive in this location. Talk to the next person, like, nope, I have the latest and greatest copy here. How do we create a one-stop shop for all that information to be there? Does it become an app, right? Does it become just stored in the in the cloud? Because literally it's about running around and finding out what, you know, and managers like to do things different. You know, someone want it all saved here. We've had managers in the past that they want us to go through drills once a year, ensure that we're ready, you know, is our recovery plan in place? Are we resilient enough? So um, you've got to keep all this documented. There, there are one, there are one-stop shops to see some lessons learned, you know. Every time we shut down and start a facility back up, we do lessons learned. Hey, what did we learn? What went well? What went wrong? What do we need to improve on? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And during emergencies, does everyone have a role? And if someone is not there, mm -hmm. um, is there a backup role? Sure. Yeah. So during emergencies, there's critical roles defined for different people. Like, for instance, our general manager is going to be the site commander for XYZ, our HSE, so health, safety, and environmental manager. He's going to be over logistics and handling, you know, reporting and responding. We have our, um, our PR person that's in charge of everything in the PR side because if there's a fire in the facility, no matter if it's as big as a match or, you know, <laughs> the whole facility fighting on fire, you're going to have news agencies, you're going to have reporters. A lot of these things can damage the image, so what we have is a person designated, and that's all they do. You know, and that person has a backup. However, with 1,000 um, folks at our facility, there's defined positions for, call it 50 or so, with a few backups on it, and then everybody else is to, you know, continue their routine job, or they're identified as non-critical and should stay home until we're able to respond, and things of that nature. So yeah, that's a good question. We have positions identified and folks that are responsible for doing some of those items. And they know this um, during the disaster itself, or do they know it for like the whole year? This is like your role if an emergency happens. Typically, it's not defined by a person; it's defined by a position. So the person in this position, because that position might change the person in it two or three times before we get another strong disaster. But one of the things you know, you get into your role, and you're now the process engineer over this area. Well, now that process engineer is responsible for these items during these type of disasters, right? So it's, it's never defined as a person, it's defined as a position. And you say it's a drill once a year, so when they come into that role as a new person, they go through this emergency drill first? So we've, had, so we've had managers, I've had a manager who once a year he wanted it, our current manager, we don't, we don't do any of the drills. You know, they review it, they update it, you know, my guess is if, some natural disasters you can predict, you, see, you can see them coming, you can prepare for hurricanes. You know, hurricane season for the most part starts at the end of August, it goes, it feels like forever, till the next, <laughs> till the next August. But there's a finite period of time where we'll start getting updates. Hey, remember, if it's identified as a category zero, business as usual, category one, monitor X, run the rate, reduce our rates by this. Because our facility, from start to finish, could take about six days to shut down completely. So you can't wait until it hits and then decide to shut down, right? You won't do it safely. And are the drills required since you say it's once a year? So is it based off manager or do you have to do it's it? It's based off manager. So yeah. you don't have to do it? The drill. Well, if, they, if, if a manager decides he wants the drills, then those that are the essential folks identify those positions and they have to be involved in the drills. 
However, there's managers that they don't want the drills. They don't go so do they the drills. So they just don't do the drills for the whole year. Yeah. Correct. So there's basically no rule for it. There's it's nothing that's defined. It's it's how a manager wants to run their facility. You know, um, it's one of those things. If you have a thousand tasks and you've got to it choose your top ten, yeah. you know, you, you pretty much I don't want to say disrupt because I think it's important, but you for the most part disrupt your entire organization to prepare for something that it's almost like insurance. Who here has insurance on their car? <laughs> Who loves paying that money every month, <laughs> right? But if you want it there, if you need it, right? So you've got to decide, do I want to pay high insurance premium on my car or health insurance, or do I want to go and buy, you know, a uh, snap <coughs> right. right? Thank you. Good question. Any other questions on resilience? I'm sure, go ahead. So you mentioned that they were the first ride out crew there for nine days. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, how did the plan ever have to shut down during that time? Or? Correct, we did. We shut down completely. Okay. That was the first time since 2010 that we had shut down entirely. And is that a requirement because of the category of hurricane it was, or was that because of the flooding concerns? So we shut down because of both. You know, water, I mean, we have, you know, a system, we have a water system to pump water out. Mm -hmm. But when it got to the point that we just couldn't manage the water around it, um, it could be unsafe, but it's more so the winds. You know, you have all these towers that are running at pretty high pressures, you know, up to 2,500 pounds of pressure. You probably don't want it running as you have winds kind of just hanging around in your facility. So it's always a management decision, you know. They're monitoring it. We're communicating with our corporate. Our manager doesn't really decide, hey, I feel like shutting down, and we're shutting down. It's a corporate communication. What is the weather telling us? What are other facilities in the Gulf Coast doing? Uh, you obviously don't want to be the only one that stays running, but at the same time, you don't want to spend seven days to shut down and then spend seven days to start up, and now you've lost 14 days of profit. Right. So have you, on those four hurricanes, you shut down every time? We shut down on two of them. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the two, one of them that we shut down, we didn't shut down completely. We kept our steam system hot. We ran extremely low flow, you know, we, extremely low rates. So we're able to come up quicker. I call that a shutdown because, I mean, there's different units that were shut down. If you start to look at kind of those processing facilities that I showed you, you can pretty much blend and make gasoline for the most part without every auxiliary unit because we make a lot of gas. See, one problem, one area that could be improved, you know, the old days, if you remember, OEMs, mm -hmm. uh, original equipment manufacturers, they will tell you that you have to do your, your, your uh, turbine overhauls every four years. Then we realized that it's really not necessary. We could, you know, and, and they wanted to stretch it to 80 eight years. And if you did enough predictive maintenance and a condition-based maintenance, you could do that. Okay, but on the other hand, the typically six years was okay. So you saved two years. You know, so when you overhaul a plant, power plant, it could be for a month or so. Okay, so many days of lost power. So in that way, with the new technology, you could say, you know, we could reduce that from seven days to four days? Yeah, so there's ways with technology that you can take a measure of, you know, <clears throat> hey, this OEM uh, company is telling us that we have to shut down this turbine, and we have to have that turbine to run, right, every four years. And, you know, to, to make sure that they can ensure, keep your warranty going and everything else that goes with it. Well, now you've just had a shutdown, right? because you've prepared for the storm, so you've taken it out and you're like, okay, let me hurry up and overhaul. You know, you can do a cost analysis of how much do I save by overhauling it now and extending my outage by one more day, or do I wait until two more years from now and take my facility down again and then overhaul, right? Are, are there such critical equipment can you identify? Or should, uh, uh, you are combined heat and power? The Cogen facility. Cogen facility. So there's, I mean, there's there's the Cogen facility. There's a lot of you know uh, high horsepower compressors, turbines that we're needing. Um, no, we not, you know, not necessarily this example. I just mm -hmm. gave. Uh, no, that's not working. Okay, but is there anything else? You know, uh, see, cyber security you identified. That's, yeah. You know, and tele, uh, and a communications through technology during uh, hurricanes you identified. Oh, I, I got a really good one. So. Hey, During, listen to this carefully, guys, okay? <laughs> Hopefully, now, now I've got to live up to it being really good. So in 2012, we actually um, had a power outage. So what we had was we actually had a snake get into a line of our main incoming, from our main incoming substation and shut our entire facility down. 
well, we have a backup line, but they don't communicate with each other, so one shuts down, the one automatically takes over, right? So after that, we have this big, huge project put in place to coordinate to ensure that if one lost power, the other one automatically took over. Well, then fast forward one year later, we had another power outage. And what happened this time? We lost communication between the two, and then the one that was running shut down. So we made ourselves more resilient, right? Resilient. We, we, ha we learned our lesson, and it's like, man, we have redundant power. What's going on? Well, guess what happened in 2014-ish? We had a project put in place for several million dollars to put a third incoming line coming in, right? So our cogent facility supplies us with electricity. We have backup electricity coming from the power company. Well, now we found another power company to give us our third line in, right? So anytime that they have, and that, that was the thing. It wasn't that they weren't, the communication was shut off because they were doing maintenance on that incoming sub. So we lost power on the one that was running. There was no communication, and they were doing maintenance on it. So, you know, we are down. We are down for days. So you look at the environmental impact. So when your facility isn't running, you've got to flare a bunch of gases and products that you can't ship out, and you can't keep them on site, you're flaring. That's in a heavy environmental feed. You start looking at the environmental side of nature. How much am I paying environmental-wise if I have a plant outage, right? So what did we do? We sent spent millions and mi hundreds of millions of dollars on getting a third line in. Sure, go ahead. How active is your trading floor whenever you guys shut down like this? Because I mean, I would imagine that would be the most optimal way to reduce how much sure. you're losing per day yeah. since you're not like, how active are they? They're, they're extremely active. And what I found out is they're extremely active from like, I don't know, 6 in the morning to like 12 or 1. Because that's where all the trading and moving around and all that other good stuff, you know, working with all the different markets play, take place. And then towards the afternoon and evening, it's like, okay, yeah, hit my goals, didn't hit my goals, hit my quota. So, I mean, it's a fat, it's a, when you say how active they are, extremely fast paced organization. Right, so are they, so like you guys are, are producing, so you're not able to sell, you're not able to sell, are they actively buying and maybe stockpiling in other parts of the country because Absolutely. you guys aren't able to do this? Absolutely. And, okay. All that's going on, right? See, so typically you do use, uh, you know, uh, standard packages for your EDR, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are the energy trading and risk management packages. So the things that are typically are ex examples are there's something called Solar. There used to be called Caminex. And now there are a whole bunch of them. So, you know, and that they're kind of all kind of consolidated. SunGuard is another one. So these packages, what they do is that on a constant basis, they're, and these uh, guys on the trading floor, uh, have you ever been to trading floors any time, right? So, so you see, uh, the, the you know crude is traded at one place, and the other products are. So they're organized by various things. In electric power side, you will see the natural gas, which is the feedstock. Okay, if the uh, you know and during hurricanes, for instance, if you have, you know, there is a uh, the hurricanes coming, the prices go up, right? Okay, so these guys go ahead and do all kinds of hedging, and, right. right? So then they said that, okay, now power lines may go down. Right. So that means electric power prices. Any of these, there is a end product, and there is also what you call the capacity. So in other words, capacity is, I have so many 300 megawatts I'm trading. Uh, energy, by that they mean is that how many megawatts are in operation? So that's a megawatt hours. So they trade both of them. But in addition to that, there are several things like ancillary service. I'm sure you have products like that in your, you know, uh, what do you call all these uh, gasoline onwards to everything. Everything they trade? Yeah, everything, everything that hits the market is traded. Is anybody interested in any of that kind of a project here? Do you think you can do that in the time frame that you have? Well, I mean, that's kind of a lot. It's, it's complicated the, to understand and, a lot of things that are going through what they're doing. In addition to that, we have a lot of catalysts, chemicals, right. hydrogen suppliers. If you've heard of Air Liquide, right. we have to have those products in to start. We right. can't cool our reactor down without hydrogen. We produce hydrogen. However, to start up, we need you know a significant supply. We normally come you know get hydrogen in <coughs> from uh, Air Liquide, but we have contracts set up with other companies that can help us get started. We need catalysts to be circulating to all these processes that we we're talking about make, taking place. We have the catalyst contracts in place to so keep us running. Right. Let's talk about in the supply chain area, sure. for instance. Is there anything uh, our students can probably? Yeah. Or both? You also mentioned the 
you know, somehow we got to get these products out sure. once you produce. Sure. So both on the, the inside as well as outside. Yeah. Right? You, oh, yeah. Is there anything that uh, you yeah. can... I think when it comes to supply chain, if you start to understand what are the supplies and external vendors needs for a facility to run, what are the chemicals that we're needing, and we went down they probably went down too, right? So okay. how do we help each other? What contracts do we set in place? Do we keep a, pro a certain amount of products stored in, in tankage on our site? Do we ask them to keep a certain amount stored in the facility? Do we manage a piece of it? Do they manage pieces of it for us? You know, Do we have people stage on that? So, so, so when it comes to supply chain, you start thinking of what all products and services are needed for a refinery to start up. And then if those products and services are disrupted, how do we ensure that they're disrupted the least amount of time, or how do we ensure they're never disrupted? I mean, there's some things that we ensure are never disrupted. You know? So, so the, where do they get this data? Um, a lot Aren't of it. They, my <laughs> mouth is by the way. Yeah, no problem. A lot of it is, I mean, through Google. I mean, I'll, I'll leave my information here with Morty. You can get a hold of me whenever uh, with any questions. Some of it's, you know, you just Google it. Some of it you just. Any specific identify. time they can call you in the evening, four o'clock, five o'clock. Uh, just call or text, and you know, at my first availability, I'll respond and go through there. And identify your team, team three, team when you call in. Okay. I think you, it's extremely kind of you. Thank you. To come here and to kind of help your university, your local university. <laughs> and I think on behalf of all our students here, yeah, thank you. I think we profusely thank you. Much appreciated. Right. You are our dream man. <laughs> right? So people go graduate from these universities. My background was in electrical engineering. I started from electrical engineering many, many years ago. I have a master's in electrical. Along the line, I bumped into big data, data analytics. And I have a master's degree too, also in computer science. And that's what I do now. Next slide. So I try to put this major. They keep telling me that it's nothing like data science, that it's all statistics. But I try to tell you the main difference between statistics and data science, and the reason why you have those eyes on data science too. Then, we talk about what big data to do. So, if there is no big data, there is no data science. That's what I tell people. Data science became popular because of the huge amount of data that we have in the world today. Data from Twitter, from Facebook, from Instagram, you know. All these things put together the reasons and the performance. You need to talk about the infrastructure for gathering the data. And that's how we talk about big data and the view. Then, also in data science, you talk about different type of models. Because when you do data science, all you're trying to do is trying to predict what's going on based on what you have in the past, right? You're trying to look at the previous, say, the last 20 years. You're trying to make prediction into what you think is going to happen into the future. And why do you think you do that? I have my data about the last 10 years. Now I'm here sitting trying to make prediction into tomorrow, into the, say the next one month. Why do I need to do that? To be prepared. To be prepared, thank you. To be prepared, to be proactive, as against to being reactive. So what we put do in the business world today is you wait for the situation to occur. Then, like you were saying, then you make plans, right? They wait for the hurricane to happen. They have outages before they knew they were going to do like three sources of power into their plant, right? If you apply data science, you apply big data, you don't need to wait. You can make those predictions ahead based on what is going on in your business, and you can react ahead of time to avoid such outages. Then we're going to talk about visualization. It's a big part of data science. When you, as a data scientist, you need to be able to tell stories. You need to be able to sell what you're doing to the business. At the end of the day, you want to have value to the business. If you can't add value to the business, then as a data scientist, you're not doing your job. So part of what you need to do as it on, on your day-to-day -day interaction, interact with people at the CXO level, CFO, COO, CEO, those are the kind of people you interact with when you do data science. You need to be able to tell stories using data, and that's why visualization is also a big part of data science. I'm going to talk about a sample project that I worked on as a data scientist, and then we'll go to a conclusion. Next. So what's data science? Like I said, there's the art going on today on data science. So we define, I define data science as a field that involves making meaning, making, gaining insights from data. The whole idea behind data science, you want to extract insights from data. So this is a brief one here. It says, wow, you answered every question perfectly. How do you do that? Right? 
And he said, well, I met with every candidate he interviewed in the last five years, collected the questions, and correlated it to the interview parameters, right? He did so well in an interview without really doing much studying, right? What he did was he looked into the past five years where they've talked to guys interviewing for the position, and he applied that to, to go to the interview. Then he said, then I built a system that predicts the exact questions you are going to ask with 85% precision. That's a good one because when I was in Texas c and in my master's degree, we had this exam. It was true or false, right? 35 questions. And this guy, one of my guys, an Indian guy, he didn't read for the exam, and he got like 25 out of 35. And I said, how did you do that? I studied so hard to make it 32 out of 35. You know what he did? He talked to guys that have gone through the same class. He figured out somehow that this professor, when he gives these questions, most of his answers are usually true. So this guy got to the exam, <laughs> picked true from one to number, from questions one to 35. And he made it 25 out of 35. What was he doing? And they were science, all right? He took his time to study the professor. He didn't study for the exam, so he made 25 out of 35. Then he said, wow, that is impressive engineering, but I can't hire you on ethical grounds. He says, don't worry. I was just field testing my prediction system. So that's the whole idea of data science. You look into the past, you predict to the future next. So as a data scientist, what are the skill sets that you need? Of course, number one is math and statistics. You need to have a deep foundation in mathematics and statistics because what we do in data science is we're applying statistical models to make these predictions, right? You have a lot of statistical models that you apply based on the data. The good thing about being a data scientist is I can apply data science in any industry, in any vertical. I can apply it in oil and gas, I can apply it in telecommunications, I can apply it in retail. Talk about any industry, finance, you can apply data science anywhere. All you need is someone that understands the business. Partner with them and you can be dangerous with the data. That's what you need, get the data, work with someone that understands the business and then you're good to go. So as a data scientist, number one, you need to have a very strong foundation in maths. And being engineering students, I'm very sure that's not a problem for us. That's why I was able to get into data science, because of my background in electrical engineering. Then also, as a data scientist, you need to have a deep knowledge in database. When we talk about data, the only way you can acquire data is through databases. If you go to Facebook, you go to Twitter, these guys, if you see what they do behind the scenes, they have huge databases that they're using to gather all this data. But for you, from your standpoint, you get online, you get on Facebook, but the back end, they have a bunch of databases that is gathering this user information. So database is a big one. You need to be able to understand databases to be a successful data scientist. When you get in the real world though, you have database administrators. If you have anyone here in the with a business major, I'm sure you've talked about databases. There's no way you can do it. So you have guys that are database administrators, that's their job. As a data scientist, you need to know what you're doing. You need to be able to do it. Because sometimes you want to grab data. If I need a data set, I don't want to wait on my DBA to be writing all the queries to grab the data from different sources. I want to be able to do that myself. That's why you need to understand programming and databases. Then, like I told you the other time, you need to be able to communicate the results of your findings to the business. Because most of your clients or most of your internal, external clients, they are the CXO executive, they are CXO levels. They don't understand the data. They don't understand all the technical jargons. I was interviewing somebody yesterday at my job. Uh, one of the I was helping someone to interview someone at the job yesterday, and the very question I asked this guy was, "Can you explain machine learning, which is an aspect of data science, to a non-technical audience?" That's my question. Explain this big jargon to a non-technical audience. I'm a business guy. I'm a CEO. I don't understand what you call machine learning. As a data scientist, I need to be able to break it down so I understand what you're trying to say. So you need that to be a successful data scientist. You need to be able to communicate your findings to a non-technical audience. And you also need some soft skills, which is also goes along with communication. So if you look at Google Trends in the past, say, few years, these are the key terminologies when you talk about data science, right? You talk about data science. When people talk about data science, are the things you see them talk about. They talk about machine learning. I just talk about machine learning. They talk about data visualization, we talk about that. They talk about artificial intelligence, that's huge. When you see about self-driving cars, Google talking about self-driving cars. 
That's what they're doing. When you see smart city applications, image recognition, you're trying to predict if an image is a car, if it's an animal, things like that. That's artificial intelligence. And in line with artificial intelligence, I what we call deep learning. All these terms go along with data science. Look at Google Trend from, say, 2012 to 2017. You can see a steady increase in those interests along the line. So that's why it's very popular. Next. So I won't spend too much on this, but basically these are the steps involved when you go and park on a data science project. You get your data set. That's the first thing. You need to be able to have the data. It could be in any form. Data sets can be in any form from any domain, from any vertical. Grab the data, number one. Number two, you clean the data. The data is not going, it's not going to come to you clean. That's why you need to be able to explore, clean the data. That's huge. Most of the data sets you're going to work with, they come straight from databases. They have a lot of junks in there. As a data scientist, you need to be able to extract, clean the data in the form where you can use it. Then after cleaning the data, you do some exploration. You look for what we call like outliers. Outliers are things you Statistics guys, they understand what I mean by outliers, but when you have a set of trends, you have everything. Let's say I'm talking about the average salary of everybody in this room, right? And everybody is between, say, 40 to 50. But suddenly, somebody jumps out and say 200. That's an outlier. An extremely big value from what you're talking about. When you work with data sets, you're going to find outliers. You need to be able to handle those outliers because they have meaning to your overall prediction. So that's part of your exploration. After that, you do some algorithms. We're going to talk about supervised and unsupervised learning along the line. That's how you model your algorithm. All you're doing, doing here is you have a set of attributes. We call them attributes in data science or futures. Like say, I'm trying to predict, um, I'll give you an example. So I'm trying to predict if you're going to default on the loan. You're applying for a loan, financial institution. I'm trying to make a prediction. Is this guy going to default? or not, right? So I have different, uh, I have my data set for the last say 20 years on all my customers. It's got their age, it's got their income, it's got their gender, it's got where they live, and I also have a data that tells me if they've defaulted before or not, right? So what you're trying to do in your algorithm is you're taking all those variables, you're putting them together to come up with a model, a mathematical formula that is telling you if someone, the probability of somebody defaulting or not. So when you apply for a loan, what the bank does is they take your input, they put it into this mathematical algorithm they've created based on what they have in the past 20 years, and the algorithm is going to tell you <coughs> chances of you defaulting or not. That's how they make decisions, we're going to give you a loan or not, right? That's just an example in financial. So at the end of the day, you make business decisions. The whole idea behind all this is you want to be able to make effective business decisions. Someone said, I would rather make decisions with data than just make decisions without nothing. Because oftentimes we found that, that when you've made decisions using data from what you've had in your business, you tend up being more effective than you just making decisions. Just like you waiting to have an outage before you react, right? If you use data, you can tell the tendency of this outage coming and you can react ahead of time before you have that next. So when you talk about big data, there are four things that come into play. I won't spend too much time on this. The reason why data science became popular is these four Vs. These four Vs here, they made data science popular. Without these four Vs, we can stay in the world of statistics forever and just do statistical analysis and be done with it. So with big data, with data science, the four Vs we talk about, number one, the volume. You have huge, can you imagine the number of tweets going on on Twitter on a daily basis or the number of status updates going on in Facebook on a daily basis is huge. So you talk about the volume. That's one of the reasons why big data, data science became popular. You talk about the variety. You have different varieties of data. It could be structured. When I say structured, it's like your Excel. You have rows and columns. That's a structured data. It could be unstructured. It could be video. It could be text messages. Those are unstructured. It could be semi-structured. Semi-structured is between structured and unstructured. If you've worked with XML files before, that's what we mean by semi-structured data. Then your data is, we're talking about the volume, the velocity, the speed at which you are ingesting that data into your database. It's pretty fast as well. And at the same time, you talk about the uncertainty. I told you the data that you're gathering is from different sources. I said that you have to clean the data. That's your certainty that you have in the data. But as a statistician, 
most of the stuff that they work on is just some clean data set and they're just trying to make some little prediction, some tiny prediction. So one of the big differences between statistics and data science is in statistics, what you're trying to do is you have a population, say all males in the United States. You know, for me to count the number of males in the United States, I might have it statistically somewhere, but let's say I'm trying to study something about all the males in the United States. It's gonna be a big tax for me, right? So what you do in statistics, you randomly pick some samples from the set of all the males that you have. And based on that random sample, you make your prediction. Based on the prediction you made on this sample, you can generalize that for the population. That's what we do in statistics. That's why in statistics, they talk about confidence interval. They talk about p-value, some technical terms that they go along because you are making decision on the entire population based on a small sample. So that's what we do in statistics, basically. But in data science, as a data scientist, I'm going to tell you to give me the data of the entire population. For me, the bigger, the better. I want to be able to learn trends. I want to be able to see patterns in my data set. That's my job as a data scientist. Next. So I'll be, if I can add to that, say the last week or a couple of weeks back, you heard uh, Dr. Heman talk about probabilistic risk assessment. So when he talks about the statistical models, you are saying that the probability of this happening, you know, because of this, 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 and then you are kind of con concluding saying that uh, based on what we, you know, you have a model that's a statistical model. Right? You are, what are you doing? At the end of the day, you are managing the risk. You are identifying the risk factors, and you are saying that if this is to happen, you know, the, based on what data we have is this. Now you also, I think many of you have heard, you no, know, also attended machine learning AI conference the other day. I don't know how many of you attended that. There again, a lot of this is coming through. Uh, you know, veracity is about the truth the data, the value of the data, basically. You know, what you put in is what you get back at the end of the day. So if you're teaching the machine how to talk, I mean, or how to, ro robot to how to behave, all this uh, tons and tons of literally terabytes, petabytes of data, you are, you know, uh, you are processing in a matter of probably minutes or seconds. So that aspect of it, for that's why this whole area has kind of got evolved. Now, what is the relevance of this for your um, natural disaster project? So what we are talking about is that you will hear about regular, typical analytical methods. And if we are asking you to challenge yourself to say, what can I do? Okay, with, there may be areas that you, you know, what he's trying to cover is just regular your databases, but in addition to what is going to happen, plus what is the state of uh, databases and state of data management, state of the so-called new art, new science called data sciences. So that's what he's going through. Okay. Thank you. So we've talked about the four Vs already, so I'm just going to skip this slide and go to the next. So we've talked about the structured data. So the data hierarchy you're going to work with as a data scientist. Structured. Structured is usually your Excel format, rows and columns. We talk about unstructured, video, text messages. And we talk about semi-structured, or XML farms. Next. So what are the kinds of analytics that we have in the big data space? The most common one that we have today is called descriptive analytics. If you see anyone in the business world that are working in the business settings today, they do a lot, a lot of descriptive analytics. All they do in descriptive is what is going on in my data now. You're trying to see what's going on inside your data set. So you do a lot of business and business intelligence, and you have a lot of tools for this. I was talking to you the other time, you talked about using Tableau. Tableau is a big BI tool. You have MicroStrategy, which is a new tool, another good tool. You also have Spotfire. Spotfire is very common in the oil and gas space. You have a lot of open source tools like R, like Python. They have visualization tools as well. So Descriptive is what is going on there today, and that's what most people spend their time doing. Like, the next one is predictive, which is why, which, why what I'm talking about today. So predictive is based on what's been going on in the past 10 years. What do I think is going to happen in the next, say, one month, right? 
right? You can make predictions on, say, the, crude, the daily price of crude oil, for example. You take data on the daily crude oil price for the past 10 years. That was a project I know someone worked on. You can make a prediction on what you think the daily oil price is going to be for the next one month. That's a good use case, right? Then prescriptive, I was also talking to him about prescriptive. Prescriptive is about optimization. I'm trying to, in supply chain, how many of us are in supply chain or business side of the house here? So what you do is you're trying to ship a product from, say, A to B, right, from source to destination. And you have a limited number of road networks, right? So what you do in optimization is you're trying to see the combination of routes that you can take that can make you ship your products from A to C with limited amount, with the, with, with the least amount of cost because you want to maximize profit at the end of the day as a business. So in optimization, all you're trying to do is you're trying to optimize the limited resources that you have in order to maximize profit. I'm trying to make this table, right? I need wood, I need nail, I need human resources, right? Let's say I have limited number of days. I'm trying to combine all this together to see how I can maximize my production. That's what you do in optimization and prescriptive analytics. These are the two, three main areas of analytics that we have. Next. So I'm just giving you some sample use cases in this one. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You want to predict machine failures. You want to predict ESP failures. This is just some use cases where you have analytics going on. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Let's go to the next one. So now we talked about Hadoop. We already spoke about Hadoop. And Hadoop is just a system for you to gather data. Because with traditional databases, you have limitation or you spend a lot of money in order to gather data. And traditional databases, they, are only, they can only do like structured data. Hadoop can do structured, unstructured, any form of data. Just dump it into Hadoop. It's a big space and it's cheap because it's open source, it's free. Next. So, uh, how many of you have heard of Hadoop? So those who you deal with, you know, data in general, this is like your, as you said, it's an open source. So it's like a, if you're <coughs> dealing with big data, all these cloud data and several other packages are there, yep. they all use Hadoop. Okay, because if you, if you have to deal with huge data, especially, yeah, both in the downstream as well as the upstream, you have lots and lots of data, especially the upstream. So you dealing with literally petabytes bytes of data. So you don't need real time functioning, fortunately there. But nevertheless, quick analysis would let you go on. Yeah, so like you said, you mentioned Cloudera. Even though Hadoop is open source, it's free, but some guys came together to give their own enterprise version. And that's where you have Cloudera, that's where you have people like Artinworks, Map R, those are the big vendors. But in Adobe, being open source from Apache Source Pro Pro Software Foundation is free. So if I want to use that tool, I can, if I know how to code very well, I can just go straight to open source and use mine. But guys like Cloudera, they made your life easy. Like instead of you doing all this, we've given you this enterprise package. It makes your life easy. And these are the various ecosystems around Adobe. When Adobe started in V1, you have to be a Java programmer to be able to do Adobe. But with V2, they made life easier with all these ecosystems around Adobe. I can be a big data engineer. We call them data engineers. The guys that do this part of the business, they're data engineers. They're the best friends of a data scientist because they, give, they gather the data for you for, as a data scientist to do your job. But as a data engineer, I really don't know to know Java to be a successful data engineer today. I can focus on Hive, which is SQL-like in nature. If you know SQL, you can do Hive. I can do scripting with Big. With all this ecosystem around Adobe today, it makes your life much easier as a data, data engineer. Next. So, so again, I think, uh, you know, it's, sorry for interrupting, okay. but the, the purpose here is to kind of communicate with you, right? So these are all, see, and what is your purpose in wanting to be in a multidiscipline project? To get a good job, right? And these are the basics of what's happening in the industry today. So when you go for an interview, you know, some guy may ask you, what is Hadoop? Okay, and you say, yeah, it's a, you know, we can analyze big data. I said, yeah, but you know, this, like what he is talking about scripting, these are all IT language. It's, you know, a lot of this is a typical database guys handle that. As a chemical engineer, would you do this every day? No. But on the other hand, would you be using this? Yes, you would be. Why? Because I think that several things are kind of converging. 
very quickly. And what you they'll be say, hey, listen, no, no, let's kind of figure out, you know, whether we can do a data, you know, a large data project, and uh, you know, go talk to the IT guy. So IT and engineering, they are merging and intersections. By the way, this is something that you say this in your interviews. There's a very good chance that the guy will ask you next question, meaning you are arousing the interest of the guy interviewer. Innovations always happen at the intersections of two technologies. Your chemical engineering and your big data. So you kind of you can you can start start letting that guy talk about. It. Nobody will expect that you are the expert in big data. You are expert in chemical engineering. You got a degree in chemical engineering. But when you start talking about this, this is the reason I wanted him to kind of go through this. Please pay attention. There are some other buzzwords. At the end of the day, you are interested in just data management. Please go on. Right, so yeah, we're talking about data mining because at the end of the day, you want to mine your data, you want to make predictions. These are the various models that you have when you do data mining. The most common models that we have are supervised. Supervised being that you have a ton of attributes and you have a column in the attribute that you already know. Like we're talking about loan, right? I have age, income, all these attributes, and I have a column in my loan in my data set that tells me if someone has defaulted before or not, right? Or let's say a use case in healthcare, like right? you're trying to predict cancer, for example, or diabetes, right? Let's say diabetes, right? And you have your you have different attributes of what you're working on, and the column in that data set that tells you if someone has been diabetic or not in the past. So you can use that to come up with a model, and you have any new a new patient, just plug their variable into your model, and you can predict their chances of ending up with that disease or not. Or you can predict the possibility of an outage in a plant or not, based on various factors, right? There was a case I worked on in oil and gas at a particular point in time. It's all about predicting support requests from the oil works, right? We have each oil well, we have like maximum temperature, minimum temperature, like location and things like that. And we have a column that tells us the number of requests from each location. Based on that, you can come up with your own model to predict what you think is going to happen on a monthly basis from any well that you have. That will aid you in planning. So in supervised models, you have a column in your data that you're using, you make, using that to make a prediction because you already know something about the past. And the most common type of model that we use is called logistic regression, and they use it for classification. Like we say yes or no variables. You want to yes or no, tall or short when you have classes in your variable. And in linear regression, what we do is you're forecasting a continuous variable, say price, right? The price of a house. I want to buy a house. Before buying my house, I want to predict what I think the value of houses should be in the neighborhood. So that's why you use linear regression. Linear regression and classification models are the most common use cases you will find when you embark on big data projects. And besides those, we have a whole lot of new areas that we apply today. And this we have all this neural network. You talk about artificial intelligence. That's where neural network comes into play. Then you have unsupervised. In unsupervised, you're just trying to understand the structure, the pattern going on in your data. And a good one is clustering. In clustering, let's say I'm embarking on a marketing campaign of my customers, right? And I'm trying to see what groups of customers do I even have. That's where clustering comes into play. You come up with, say, five groups of customers based on all the customers that you have. And you want to see what's common to each group. Based on what's common to each group, your sales team can target those groups for particular product offerings. That's what we do in clustering. And sentiment analysis is a big one, opinion mining. When people review your products, say you're selling, you have a business, people go online, they make Twitter feeds about you, they, make, they, they say different things about you. So people can say, oh, this is good. So people can say, this is bad. Can say, yeah. So what you're trying to do is based on all these explanation, all these reviews, you're trying to come up with their opinion, trying to mind their opinion. What does that do to your business? When you mind people's opinion about what they think about you, you know how to react. If they are thinking good about you, okay? If they are thinking bad about you, you know you need to react as a business before you start losing customers. Then we talk about reinforcement learning. That's a new one. I won't spend too much time on that. Next. We're talking about data visualization already. I won't spend too much time on that as well. We talk about visualization. I won't spend too much time. So I want to spend the next five, ten minutes talking about this case study. So what we're trying to do in this case study is we have about 
I used to work at Verizon, right? I spent 11 years working at Verizon. So we have about 70,000 cell towers across the United States in Verizon. In the Eastern Gulf Coast, which happens to be my sub-market, we have about 3,000 cell towers. Your cell tower are those towers that you communicate to when you make phone calls. So this, they get busy sometimes, right? Depending on how the users on them. So what we're trying to do here is trying to predict utilization on the network devices that you have in each of these locations. The reason we're trying to do this is because Verizon manages customer expectations because number one, you don't want to, you don't want customer complaints, you don't want drop calls, you don't want things like that, right? So you manage customer expectations through bandwidth. At the same time, this bandwidth is very expensive. You buy it from people, right? So what you're trying to do is trying to find a balance between your bandwidth and the customer expectation. That's why this was very huge in this project because when you don't know the right bandwidth, you tend to pay more. When you know the right bandwidth, you think you're okay. When you have less bandwidth, customers complain. So how do, I how do I balance the customer expectation against finance at the back end? That's why this was huge. So next. So what we did here is, like I said, that's the business problem. You're trying to manage customer service through bandwidth utilization. You have network devices, they are being utilized at a past certain percentage. Sometimes you have peak utilization, like maybe in the afternoon or maybe in the morning. So those kind of things you put in together, you have a data set that gives you all those variables, and at the end of it, all you're trying to do is make accurate prediction so you can balance costs with customer expectation. Next. So basically, the potential that this project had, when I did this project, was it had the potential to reduce operational expense by 50%, that's huge. When you reduce your operational expense by 50%, that's a lot of money. And basically, what I found out from this project is if we adequate, if we size this backhaul right, the utilization right, 50% of the time, we're not using what we have in these locations. And we are paying for them. We're paying for them in fear of customer service, right? By the end of the day, you need, we only need like 50% of what we have. That's what Jera did. By mining what we have in the past few years, we're able to come at that. At the end of the day, we only need 50% of this bandwidth in each of these locations to manage our customer expectations. And that led to huge savings. Next. In this, you know, I'll come up with all the models. Next. These are the very, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into all this. Unless you have interest in data science and you want to talk to me on a different day, we can talk about all these ARIMA models. When you do what we call time series, if you're interested in going final, it was talking about trading. When you trade, this is where this comes into play. You're doing daily forecasts. When you do forecasting on a daily basis, you're dealing with what we call the time series problem. That's when you talk about ARIMA models. So that's what I applied in my model. And you can see right here, what I did here is on these dates, these are the predictions that I have and these are the actual utilization and this, uh, in those locations. So basically what I did was, for each of these days, this is what actually happened, this is my prediction, the prediction I came up with. It was within 5% accuracy, that's why the business had confidence in this model. That's why we were able to deploy this model. Next. And Super Bowl 51 was hosted in Houston recently. Based on my model, we were able to make some predictions on all the key locations that we have in the Houston metropolis in terms of what we think we need in terms of bandwidth and network devices in order to manage customer expectations. Next. And the impact of that project is a sample project, right, within Houston. It's $4.8 million in savings in one year, just in one year. And Houston only had about 3,000 cell towers. And Verizon in general has about 70,000. If you can, if you have a potential to save $4.8 million based on 3,000 sample case study, you see the potential you're going to have when you talk about 70,000 if you do the math. And that's one of the big areas where the science is being used, it's being utilized. And based on these are the recommendations that I made that as a business, we need to focus more on data driven business decisions. Either way, we're going to make decisions whether we like it or not. We're meant to make decisions as a business. Executives will make decisions. But I would rather they make decisions based on data than just make decisions based on activities, right? So like, if you have, you wait on your outages to happen before you make decision. That's being reactive, that's to me. With this advent of big data and all the technologies that we have today, we have no excuse not to be proactive as a business in whatever business area you find yourself. So basically, the key takeaway from this presentation is you can never take for granted the value of data-driven 
business decisions, no matter what. I'd rather make decisions based on data than just make decisions on the fly. And that's it. Thank you. So any questions for Abby? See now, uh, see there, there are several platforms that are being used. You know, SAP, Oracle, okay, you know, Microsoft. Data basis. Every one of you know, every one of them have as part of their ERP suite. Mm -hmm. They have something. You know, they started off with a what they call business intelligence, mm -hmm. and now they have they call it a platform. Predictive mind. And. Uh, so, is there anything that Verizon use something like that? Or is yeah, Verizon actually uses Tableau, right? At the back Tableau, of, yeah. yeah. It's a visualization. Yeah, tool. visualization too. But Tableau also has some predictive mining into it. See, these are all very important buzzwords, you know, for you to pick up. That's the only purpose of this. You don't need to be experts at this. Your expertise is in chemical engineering, legal, whatever you're learning. But it is absolutely important that these, these things, when you go for the interviews, and when you start using it, you know, when, when you get on the, in the project, these are the things that are important. So, I got about two, three slides. Immediately after that, I'll turn it over. My purpose of doing this, I looked at what slides she had. Thank you very much, Abhi. Yes, sir. Okay, I appreciate that. And say thanks to uh, Gibi for me, you know, for us and all of us, right? So, so um, can I? Okay, I guess you're going to try it. Uh, okay. So, uh, let me quickly, uh, what I wanted to talk about is just take what is God, what you are doing, and I want to say what you will see when you go into a company. Okay, so get into this. So, you know, this, at one time, you know, this is a project that I was working on with a company, and these are the IT guy, meaning somehow got into a company that was, that is IT company, but I was, my expertise in the domain. So that, the typically what you talked about, data cleaning, data architecture design, and then the old way of doing analysis, if you, if it's a, you know, if you created, if you had an IT guy coming and working with you, he would have what they call extract data, transform data, and load the data. So that you can have these data marks, and you can do the analysis. Whether you like it or not, you're going to find that when you join the company, you know, this is what you do. And then you have this visualization analytics, what he was talking about, is a presentation layers. Okay, what, boring stuff, huh? Little bit, is it a little bit boring? <laughs> okay, then advanced analytics. Now that data science and all this, uh, there are, SAP has something called HANA. They have their own database. And then, um, uh, this is choose, they used to use Oracle database before, but now they switched over. Oracle has something called Exaltics and Indica. Microsoft for upstream, they have something called um, uh, Microsoft upstream something something Mura architecture. So and and then there are standards like uh, CPDM and POSC for the upstream, and they have something called. <coughs> PO something, I forget that, it's for the midstream and downstream. So basically, and then what you look at it is, at the end of the day, what he was talking about is making the decisions happen. How do you do the decisions? How you present, that is the piece that's very important. So you kind of move towards the optimization and get into the prescriptive model. And now when you see that, you know, many companies won't allow you to close the control loop. Control system is giving you a lot of real-time data. So in addition to structured, unstructured, you also have real-time data you're dealing with. Especially if you're trying to make uh, decisions very, you know, in, in very critical items. So this is a Gartner chart. Now, what I wanted to also show you is that what's a, if you are in a business school, you know, whether in 1960 or whether you're here, these are the typical kind of thing that you would see. You know, I talked about clustering. So each, any algorithm that you develop is good only for a certain range. Anything that you're developing, what do you do first thing? You assume, you make assumptions you make. Based on your assumptions, if they're not applicable, that algorithm may not be applicable. So 
So, but then you can have, in the way these data sciences are working these days, is you have this algorithm is good for this range. This algorithm is good for this range. So you have a clustering of those algorithms to kind of work with that. So the, and a, and a Markov modeling and all these, uh, they're, they're also, in, in the next slide. So this is, I'm going to give you these slides. This is nothing, just like reading a textbook. This will be useful for your interview time. Oh yeah, but what am I expecting out of this project? Simple ROI. Meaning, you know, do some, uh, 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 what do you call it? You, you know, if you're saying that I'm going to invest X amount of dollars to make this improvement. So I would like to see, you know, how a business decision is made. This go into deep, deeper and deeper, lots of stuff. But I think what where the technology is moving is in addition to the traditional tools and IT advances, and you're also seeing many technologies kind of converging and emerging. Meaning all this machine learning, how is that happening? Neural networks, it started off, but then you have, you know, very quick crunching of the data. But in addition to that, you get a vision, you know, the literally, you know, you can see it, you can feel it. You know, your iPhone is a good one. There's someone, uh, Google, I think, <coughs> Uh, someone I was in a talk. They said that you know how many body parts are there. They said there are something like you know 52 or something. Like that. I said no, 53. Because now you have you know your iPhone. You can talk, touch, make it do whatever you want. Okay, and Alexa at home, right? So all that. So the in more another important thing is user experience design. These are so. In other words, if you're developing a product, you can. This is a piece of art. Oh yeah, a lot of technology has gotten in there, but in addition to that, you are also kind of saying that this is what is called user experience design. So these are the terminologies that you are kind of getting in, and these are important. I don't know whether you guys learned this in the business school or not, but in when you go in there, first one day one your manager will call and tell you, you know, I, I want you to, it's, you know, I'm not interested in GUI. GUI is what? graphical user interface. But I want to make sure that you are addressing the user experience design. I said, what is that? You know, first time when I heard it, then they gave me an example, iPhone. <coughs> then I understood. So so a lot of these, uh, you know, IT industry, for instance, you know, they, when they did the outsourcing, right, they were monitoring lots and lots of applications from, from India and some other places, right? But, you know, so the, the only way they could do that is by creating a way of, uh, you know, what they call, they call it ticketing an item. If there is wrong, you put in a ticket, or put a number and address it. And similarly, the telephone, kind of gives you a notification. All these technologies came over a period of time. They are all kind of converging now into this machine learning, robotics, all that kind of stuff. So whether you like it or not, 10 years from now, you know, now today you can work from home. 10 years from now, you, you may not be needed. At least I will not be needed, but you, if you kind of go into this mode of kind of learning, Kind of saying that being one step ahead than others, you will definitely, you know, it's not only, you know, you don't want the, the technology to catch up with you. You want to be ahead of technology. That is the purpose of this last few slides. That's it, I think I'm done, I think that. Yeah, there is a platform. So what they've done is, this all these step, you know, the things, data integration, data, there are, these are the, the tools that are being utilized. This, this whole platform was called iCube or something. In those days, Veracity was not there, volume. So, so they created this. These are the standard packages, as you would see. This is useful as a reference material. That's about all. And, you know, I, uh, I leave it at that. And now I invite Dr. Rather, any questions for you guys? From you? Yeah. When you say packages, what do you mean? <coughs> huh? When you say packages, what do you mean? See, um, Oracle. Right? Have you heard of it, right? I've heard of it, but I don't. Okay, you haven't. Okay, good. Whether you like it or not, you will hear it. Okay. Uh, SAP. By the way, don't call it a SAP. 
Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there is a particular SAP stands for Microsoft. You know, you, you use Windows, right? Windows is a, you know, from their viewpoint, software uh, viewpoint, Windows is a package. Okay, it does particular function. So there are so many functions. So these are all, when you say platform, platform is it's got several functionalities. So you use those. So for instance, you know here, you know it, you can you can manage your data. You can uh, you know there are algorithms that you can pull. So you don't. It's already part of them, right? So when I say a package, packages of software, you you buy it and you can start using it. Like uh, you, I'm sure you use math tables, right? It's a uh, MATLAB, huh? MATLAB, right? That's a package. Okay. Okay, but if you put that into let's say big data platform, it's one of the many things. Hadoop is a component of a platform. Okay, so Hadoop is what he explained to you. Yeah. So it has all these pieces together and you kind of apply it, you, you know, you pull it and you don't need to reinvent that. It's as part of that. So the what is the message here? Message is analytics can be done quite fast these days. By the time you are into your job, you will have these, this, this will be like, uh, just like you are using a word today, or Excel spreadsheet, you will have this analytics package you are expected to use somewhere along the line. You know, you don't have to be an IT expert to do this. Okay, because most of the stuff is not, even though IT is used to kind of put these together, it is actually it's an engineering or math algorithm. Anything else? Well, Dr. Radha, now, Dr. Radha is going to tell you, you are in a project now. Okay, you are in team now. So high performance teams, how do they operate? Basic principle, kind of check yourself whether you're doing that or not. And project management, okay, I haven't done task one, task two, task. So there is a, there are simple, uh, with here, with his experience at Shell Oil Company and several other jobs that he has done, he's going to share that knowledge with you. Have I said it right, rather? Project management, project management is a very large field. Lots and lots of things. But I'm not going to cover all of that. I'm just trying to cover what is just in time for you to be able to use in your project. Okay, moving on. Um, so what's a project plan? The contents of a project plan, planning process, something called work breakdown structure, and other things, multidisciplinary things. Generally, whenever you get a project, take a something like uh, you bought a kind of kit from IKEA, what do you do? Immediately you dive in, open all the parts, and then start fixing things. Then suddenly you find that there are three nuts and you have no clue where they went. And then you just say, how does this fit? And so now you just say, okay, let me read the instruction sheet. And then you find you have to take it all apart and then re-put it together. Right? How many of you have not done that? Have always opened the instruction sheet first and then started doing step by step? Well, some of you are lying. But anyway. <laughs> Maybe. Did you see? Out of the all, there's only two people. General practices, ready, fire, and then worry about aiming. So you're already into it full time and working on things. So just imagine the first day when you got this project. Guys were all helter skelter, right? Come on, let's go Google this and then you're going to take care of that. You hadn't even thought through what has got to be done because you're so anxious to get on with it. Projects cannot be done that way. It has got to be a lot more where you plan, then you execute before you start operating. Very, very large projects. I'll go back to the previous one. So it is, sometimes people will be sitting down and talking about it, talking about it, nothing gets done. That's analysis uh, and the paralysis. So you have to have a proper balance and you have to have a clear there is a planning phase, and then there is an execution phase, and then in most cases, there is an operation. That means whatever you have done in your project, somebody is going to go ahead and take it and use it, okay? Whatever recommendations you come. The reason this is very important is 
Whenever you do large projects, you know, you can learn from that even for small projects. Whenever you have large projects that can run for several years, and uh, it will, if you don't think about everything in the beginning, as you progress further and further out, there is no way you can go back and say, now let's read the plan, take all the parts apart, and then refix the, the kit that we were supposed to assemble. Almost impossible. You probably have blown away a ton of money. So, the uh, next one. So the key thing here to really look at is, uh, this is what they use in large projects. I'm just using that the same way for your project. You can think about it. When you start out, there is a front end where there is a, you know, you think about what it's, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? And then there's a little bit of project planning. You know, what are all the things that can be done? Then comes a project definition phase. What is the problem you are really trying to solve? If you just rush, this is takes not much money, takes time. At that time, you have not made any, in, you know, the influence is very high. You can change things, like what are you going to be studying? You know, are you going to be looking at this project or that aspect of the project or this aspect, aspect of the project, which is more priority, you know, higher priority, which is a lower priority? All of that you can think through. But once you are starting in this area where you are be going to be spending, in your case, a lot of time. Now you're starting to do the Google searches, reading literature, and so on. If you have been reading the wrong article, that is total waste of time. Because you find out at the end, that was totally rubbish. That's not at all relevant to what I wanted. But you've already lost the time. So you need to be thinking about initially, before you start diving in, have a clear definition of what are the things that are important. We will come to how to really get to that in a second, okay? But then when you are investing all the time, your, now your influence is very little. What does that mean? You're reading an article. You're only starting to focus on that particular problem in that article. You don't have time to read other articles and look at other areas. So, spend a lot of time here. And that is more critical. Generally, if you take a project, let us say, to make it easy, it's a 10-year project. There are projects that run easily 10 years. This would probably be about six years. In fact, it could be even seven. This phase of it would be generally about two years. That's where you spend the money. And at that time, you're spending money like water. Same thing, you're going to be spending. Once everybody has told you, here are the eight articles that you want to read. Reading those eight articles and coming back with your answers is very easy because you are highly focused and you're going to be focusing on what you get out of it and then you're going to draw your conclusions. Then the implementation phase, at that point, you know, you cannot go back and then do anything. Okay? So, spend a lot of time here, disproportionate amount of time. That is what I call as about spending time on defining the project. Understand what's the problem. And I mentioned that at one time before also. I've had, you know, in my last years at Shell, um, I was involved in lots of troubleshooting. I mean, there could be some problem, and then you're called in. And you're given some, let's say, 70 days to really just say, what's the problem? Come back and tell me what, how I should fix it. Generally, it's a one-person kind of an activity. You probably, out of that 70 days that you have, probably 55 days, I would just still be understanding the problem. It takes just about five days to really hone down what is the critical one, what's the answer. If you have understood the problem well, answer is very easy. Because it will almost stand out there. You don't have to spend a lot of time. So as you are looking at this, spend a lot of time. What am I going to be focusing on? Be very clear and then focus on that. Then you will learn a lot. Okay? So let's go back. <clears throat> and then how do you start that? Uh, no, next one. The, Going forward, yeah. So elements of a project master plan, you've got to have an overview. So here it is, you're looking at resilience. Resilience of a petrochemical plant. A petrochemical plant, you saw the picture, 230 acres. Which part of it are you going to focus on? Lots of areas you can focus on. 
And if you just say, I'm going to look at all of that, there's no way on God's green earth you have the time. You're just given a little bit of time. So you need to say, what am I going to focus? Draw your boundaries very clearly. And he keeps saying, you know, whenever each one of them gave a talk, he was just saying, what are the things that are most critical? He said about communication. Okay. He was just using that as an example. Just when you take communication, there is a lot of work to be done in communication. You need to understand what is communication, and then find out what has been done, not done, and then dig into what may be your alternate. So there is a lot of work within that itself that you have to do. But the fact, if you didn't pick communication, it was important, and you picked something else because you were all running all over and didn't focus, you can never come back and then pick up communication. You don't have time. So. Um, you need to be thinking about what, you know, and at the end of that, be very, very clear. This has got to be so clear. What am I delivering? Okay? In fact, many times, it may be easier to start with what is the answer. And I just say, you don't know the answer, but you know the elements of the answer. I need to have a clear business plan. So what in a business plan? I have to come with what is the problem, what is the solution, what is the financial analysis, if you had started working on it and said, oh, financial analysis, we never collected any data on how much it is going to cost. Too late. You don't have time to finish that portion of it. So sometimes starting with the end result and writing them all out and then saying, how am I going to get that? And that will focus you on not these 43 articles that you've got ready to read. It just says that didn't contain financial analysis. So you'll put them into three or four piles. That's all financial analysis, and you just say, okay, Joe, you take that and read all of those. Now you're able to allocate who is going to be doing what a little bit, because you knew what has got to get them. Starting with the answer and going backwards. Give you an example. I had a business in chemicals that we had to come up with a plan, and we had about 60 days. This is, is the business running correctly? How do we do the whole business differently? So that was the recommendation. We had to go back to the to the chemical board. You clearly knew what are the you know what are the deliverables. So on day one, we just sat down, thought about it. We have done so many of these, laid out about 60 slides, 50 slides. All the slides were laid out. They were all mockups. There was no data in them. So titles were all written. Now you start focusing. What do you need? Now you're very very targeted. And that makes it very sharp. Very quickly, you can finish. And given what time frame you have, you've got to be absolutely crisp on deliverables. And then you will know what you have to deliver in what time frame. Because some things take a little bit longer. Some things you may have expertise. So you can just say, I should have completed this much. Or else, it's a wishful thinking saying, I got to finish about a third in this and a third in that. And you think you've got a plan. You have absolutely no plan. All you're doing is a wishful thinking. So have that and uh, the rest of it. <clears throat> now, detailed description of project <clears throat> plan for recovering from any one of these uh, incidences, like a hurricane or whatever. What could you be looking? Got to be very specific. And when they give you that, is that what you were focusing on? Or were you focusing on something else? And that kind of a thing you can ask. So this, initially, if you, even if you don't have it, write your statement. But when you have the opportunity to talk to the right people, validate that. OK, moving on. <clears throat> so there is something called hierarchical planning process. There is a way in which you can do. So when somebody starts out with a very large project, yours is a relatively a small project. So really starting off with a large project. You don't even know what are all the parts you have to be thinking about. So you cannot start with a you know, very detailed one, whether this nut fits there or not. You need to have an overall picture. So that is, and then you dig in layer after layer. So that's what it is uh, talking about. Go on to the next one. There is a, something called uh, uh, work breakdown structure. You know, many of you, you know, may have worked at some places. If you have not worked at it, you will be working, so you will learn this. They will always tell you, you need to charge your time. Here is an account you have to charge your time to. 
what it is is they will give you a, a number and it is a WBS and then a string of numbers. That is a work breakdown structure. For a corporation to assimilate how all the costs are coming together, is this cost in the right bucket? And I want to know how much did this person, did he cost me? What are the work that he did? Where the benefits were? Similarly, in a large project, you don't need to know what are all the cost elements that are going. And you need to also know who's going to be doing what work. So you need to know what is the detailed work. So that's what you're going to prepare for yourself. If you did that, it becomes rather easy for you to say, stay focused. Moving down, let's write down the next one. Go down. I want to show you. Let's think about a simple example. If you're going to have an annual casino night event. There are different ways you can think about it. So initially, you can all sit around and say, so what is involved? We are all harebrained. So somebody will just say, God, we need to really think about the food we're going to eat. Where are we going to have this place? So initially, don't worry. Paste all these things on the wall. They are random thoughts. They are not connected. And then you put them out. Oh, the food. Somebody will just say, I think we should get it from this restaurant. Food is great. It is cheap. But that comes after you thought about the food. Because that restaurant, what food is going to be, that's not what you're going to be offering on that day. You're wasting time trying to talk about that other company. So when you finish this, you will have, sometimes people call this as an influence diagram. Somebody, some people call it as a mind map. I don't care about the title that you give. You need to do one of these things. This is one way to do it. Okay. Moving on, next one. Here is another way to do it. So here it is, annual tribute dinner. And you can think about, again, take a bunch of uh, little, little uh, stickies. Everybody write whatever random thought comes to their mind. Put it all on the wall. And then start grouping them. What you will find is, there is a whole bunch that goes under the event host. Somebody has to send out the invitations. There is entertainment part of it. There is food and drink. And then at the end, there is a thank you note. OK? These guys have done it for years. I don't know how you did it, but I'm sure pretty now it is now down to these kinds of big headings. And then under each heading, now you decide what are all the sub things that have to go on. And sometimes it will go three, four levels. And the reason you need to go down is then there is clarity on how all this builds up to that. Is something missing? Sometimes for invitations to be done, you know, you need to know, or food to be done, you need to know how many guys are going to be coming. And somebody says, well, invitation guys need to tell me. Well, which means the invitations have to be finished, and you should have to get some feedback before you can decide on the food. But you can decide on the food. You can hold back on the number of food that you're going to order. So it's a little bit of an iterative process. But if you didn't know what the basic works are and how they are related, Okay, so you will have some missing links, but as you go down, you'll be able to connect them up. You need to prepare a chart like this for your job. And initially, you won't know, and once you have done this, you will find how much you lack in your thinking. What is missing in this? Is it, is it all about just these two? Food and just the, you know, where we are going to hold it? You suddenly realize I'm missing. There is an invitation part of it. Thank you. You may not have even thought about it, but that's a significant part of doing all of this. So you will see what is missing. But if you are so engrossed in all the details on just the two, because that is an area you love to work, you have so much energy to work on just the food part of it. You focus on that. You have just missed out everything else. Same thing in your project. You really need to look at, and then you will know what is more important, what is less important, and then that we can prioritize. Moving on to the next one. I think I have one more. Yeah, this is banquet. Again, some people put it down in a different way. And uh, people will call this as 1.0, 2.0, and then 1.11, 1.12. Those are all the ways in which you subclassify. If you're in a very large project, you need to have that kind of a, so that you know if I'm working on you know, 17.3, then I know how does it, or 17.3.4.2, I know I'm in the 17 category. 
and I know I'm working in that organization. So all of that is easy to think about. Let's see the next one. All right, here is one construction of a house. There is internal, there is foundation, there is external. Lots of different, different things, and some of these things have to come one before the other. You will also know the time element, which comes first, which comes next. You can draw those connections easily. Or you can just say, if I'm going to finish this in May, I have to finish that prior to this, or else I cannot complete the other activity. All of that you can do. So, before I go any further, how many of you have really taken a shot at something like this? Whether it is in this format or is it in the very first mind mapping kind of a format? Yeah. So, so some of you teams have, because these guys working in the EC, they have been, if they didn't do it, they got railroaded in <laughs> one event or the other, right? Because when you run a big one where there are 300 people being invited, and if you have not practiced, whether it is a, a banquet that you're holding or something else you're doing, of that kind of magnitude, you cannot be organized unless you have taken some steps. The rest of it, rest of you can easily learn this. This is not rocket science. However, it is about patience and it's about discipline. I'm sure somebody in your team, after the first to two days, the guy says, we haven't even gotten anything done. I, we should be reading articles. You know, they're already in just, you know, se step 17, and you haven't even decided what is to. And they are getting so anxious, he says, already two weeks are over, we should be. Just say, hold your horses, just to be way waiting, and then we will figure it out. Because if you don't take the initial steps carefully, the very first chart, chart that I showed you, you can be retracing your steps many, many times. And don't feel bad if you have done this. I can trust you guys who are getting paid to do this correctly, they all retract their steps many times. <clears throat> Moving on. Then another important aspect that comes. Who is going to be doing what? In every project, or anything that you do, two things that are important. First, you need to have what is it that you're going to be doing, and who is doing what. Now, it's very easy. So why don't you take care of that? And somebody will say, why don't you take care of this? That's one way to do it. And then the guy just says, what do you mean by taking care? Am I the big boss and I can make, you know, the budget is so much, I'm going to decide all of that? And then when something goes wrong, he says, well, you know, it happens. All these guys didn't finish their job. Pretty soon, if anything goes wrong, it is those guys. And if everything went right, it's me. Right? People have the tendency. So this is very important to really draw. Let me explain what this one is. Go to the next chart. There are words like responsible, accountable, and consultant, and informed. It's called RACI. The two words that are most misunderstood are responsible and accountable. People will say, I'm responsible for this when in fact they think they are accountable. Or somebody will just say, I'm accountable, and they are thinking they are responsible. So let's understand the difference between these two, so that you have it very clear. Responsible means those who do the work. You have to complete the work. And accountable means you need to make sure that the work is getting done. If anything goes wrong or right, your tail is in the crack. That's the accountable person. There is only one accountable person for one of those big tasks. There cannot be two people who are accountable for the same task. Yeah. There's only one person who's accountable. So, if you are leading the project, if something went wrong, you turn around to that person and say, you are accountable. Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you get it done? You don't need to talk to anybody else people should have that sense to say, I am accountable. That means I got to somehow make sure it gets done. There are lots of people who are willing to help you getting it done. That's the responsible part of it. And it is so easy to misunderstand these two words. 
I have a, sorry to interrupt you, see I have a lady from Landel Basel. Who well, used to run uh, Shell's Nigerian operation. She was the president of Shell Nigeria. So I was in his office and then uh, he was just reading the report. This is late, pretty late in the afternoon, about 5.30. So before going home, I just stopped by his office. And then uh, he was reading this report, thick report, reading it. I said, Basil, what are you reading? And uh, he just said, I'm reading this uh, HSC report, Health, Safety, and Environment. Very, very critical piece in every company. So he said, I'm reading that report. Uh, I said, why are you reading Hello? such a report? It's a, such a thick report. And yes, uh, he said, you know, I have to uh, sign just, off on uh, this one. I'll put you on a speaker. I said, that's a interesting. Minute. But do you understand all that is written here? He said, no. Then why are you wasting your time reading it? Because I'm signing off on it. If my signature book, but when you don't understand all of it, you're not an HSC expert. What does that mean? Well, I have to sign off. He said, Basil, you're completely mistaken. You don't understand what you're signing for. Okay, uh, you know, we're getting this slide. Your corporation says that you what need to have an HSC report. Slide and and as such, you are accountable. Okay, so as soon as what are you accountable done, for? For having a report done. Yeah. Okay, so Your HSC connected. manager is accountable for that it be correct. You can, yeah, you can hear me, but You but are only, you? you should have a system whereby a report is being released so we have to every year. Computer you are not into the details. Typical. Besides, if you were an HSC expert and you did this, and you did like this in several other reports, who is doing your job of running the company? They're all into everybody else's knickers. Then yeah. you should be worrying about your job. And it is not because he mistakes responsible for accountable. And accountable at different levels are different. And if you don't understand that, you will be doing things that you should not be doing. So when you are doing your report, just to be sure you're clear who is going to be doing what. Yes, you may get it mixed up, but that's okay. But be sure that who is going to be doing it. There are two other things that you saw. Consult and inform. Very, very important. If you are working on one aspect of it, you need to make sure that you inform people who need to be informed about what you're doing so that they can do their job correctly. And sometimes others may give you input that is useful for you to do your job. That's where the consult comes in. So those are to be very clearly understood. That way it becomes easy. I'm working on this section and I need to, you know, you need to give me information. I will get the work done. So be very clear. Okay. You know, people from various teams, and uh, you know, you would you remember what you sent, or shall I uh, read it? Uh, no, I, re I remember. Okay, so uh, Lyndale Basel, and she's a training manager there in the plant, and she has given us two possible problems that you could all be thinking about. So, and I'll keep quiet and I'll let uh, Carola explain that to you. Okay, so uh, the, the problem number one, and I, I don't know if it was made of what I wrote, but um, I met with our HSE specialist. He was very involved with the last storm. Of course, the last storm is definitely different because uh, we also attach our procedure, and our procedure goes by different phases based on the weather conditions, and it's primarily based on wind. And what our challenge is, and I'm sure we're not unique at our company, is we're all watching the weather. We're getting weather updates very often from Storm Geo, and we're trying to anticipate when to activate what we call our uh, phase one planning in the procedure. And so um, the, uh, the accuracy obviously a prediction and it takes a while to shut down the plant. So our problem statement, is there some better modeling, maybe, um, I don't know what kind of predictive modeling you have learned, something that maybe would be help us better utilize the tools with the weather to correlate with our procedure and the different phases. 
uh, one of the things is that once once you activate the procedure, then you have certain staffing levels, etc. But um, of course, if there's a lot of wind, a lot of water, you can't activate the procedure exactly because you have the plant and they're not able to get home. And so to, where you were hoping to get a certain, what we call a right out for the volunteer, now you're, you're there with the existing crew. So anything that helps us be more efficient and more effective, knowing which, where we're at and where, what phase, and then any contingency planning. So um, I know it's a difficult one because we're all using the same tools, but maybe you all have some ideas that may um, make us more efficient. You think the number two is, um, needless to say, we're, you know, we're using, we have short resources to begin with, and we have different people in mind. And um, something that seems simple is everybody going in to something like Transstar or Texas.com or something where they're looking at what is the best route to take. Because part of it is who can even come back and forth. Um, assuming the storm, you know, has passed, we want to get people that are in their recovery. Uh, phase. So, is there uh, an efficient way where the plant can be sending out um, something with those tools that are available and it's easy for the employee to utilize them? Right now, what we tell them is please use those tools and uh, chart out the, you know, if you're able to safely return to work. But if we can be more, I guess, um, where it's obvious, you know, what the tools are, or how to, you know, where to get the tools, that may make it easier for the employees to know where, the, you know, where we're at at all times. So it's, a, it's already using uh, some of the existing city tools, but um, becoming, I guess, a little bit more efficient with those as well. So those are the two scenarios. We picked those two because those two were ones that came up multiple, more than once in our in our lessons learned. And um, a lot of them are contingent upon either having, you know, knowing when, the, once you read the procedure, I think it'll make a lot more sense because the procedure is how we go from one phase to another depending on where the storm is and um, the predictability of the storm. So that activates us into the different phases of planning and recovery. Very good. Thank you, Carola. Okay. Is there, yes, and I think uh, I also mentioned to the folks that there's a possibility that at least some of us will be meeting with uh, your uh, plan manager on 19th, between 3 and 4. That is the date I think Lisa had given us. So yeah, and I'm going to confirm, you know, if he, if he, what his um, availability is. She, his calendar changes frequently, but I'll confirm that. And if not, once I know the type of questions, we have, um, you know, others that can... It's accountability. Who is communicating with who and uh, what kind of information needs to be, you need to take in from others and you need to provide others. So moving on to the next step. Um, we have another one, right? Next one. Are you, can you flip to the next chart? Um, okay. So I've given you all of that just in terms of project management. Two, only two things that you have to really remember. Do a lot of uh, you know, planning ahead of time in terms of what you're going to work on before you dive in and get yourself immersed in it. Because at that time you will be down into you know, the trees and you will miss the forest. So sit, focus on the forest first and then get into the trees. Then after that, you need to be really breaking it down, what you have to accomplish, and be clear who's going to be doing the work. Now, as you meet, you know, when you meet as teams, you know, some people will not be there, some people will be there. You gotta get to the discipline where everybody is there. Because or else it is a huge communication challenge. You know, you have a certain amount of responsibility to the team, and so you need to be there when people meet and contribute to it. 
So how do you really make yourself into a high performance team? This is what high performance teams generally do. Move on to the next one. You can read that. You must be very clear what are you trying to accomplish. Spend a lot of time initially. That's what I said in the project management. What are the area you're going to focus on? Suddenly after three weeks are over, somebody comes, you know, I discovered this great article. And I think we should be moving into this one as opposed to what we were doing. That is completely not right. Don't ever allow such a conversation to happen because you will constantly be rediscovering something. And that doesn't mean you change the goal. You've got to be on what you started out with because or else you will never accomplish anything. You are flying from one you know, uh, flower to another flower like a bee and you're never collecting anything, okay? So initially you need to know what is it that you have. Take a time. Once the decision is made, don't revisit whether that was the right one. You've already done that, just you have to charge ahead. But if you charge ahead too quickly, that's when all these things will happen. After three, three weeks, somebody will be second guessing that you could have done something different. That's because you didn't spend the time in the beginning to really think it through. And uh, the second one that you want to be thinking about, results-driven structure. Whenever you guys get together, this is not to have, you know, chat and have a, you know, nice time and drink all your Coke and eat a pizza. That's not what you're getting there for. You are about, you know, understanding your progress. You have very limited time. And so you need to be very, very clear. Hey, we came in with these, have you brought it? You know, if somebody comes in, well, I was busy. Excuses are inexcusable. Just don't allow that. And if somebody does that, say, please, next time, don't do it. Send us your result by the end of today, because we have to be, you're holding everybody up. And everybody should have that sense of, you know, sense of urgency, and then be into it. Confident team members. You know, you have who you have in your team. People can be say, you know, guessing all the time, oh, he is not very good, or she is not good. Don't try to do that. Everybody is very qualified. And what you have to do is, how can I leverage what they are very good at? So people, when they self-select and say, I'm going to work on this area, what you're saying is, not only am I very competent, or I will you know, get up on the competency ladder very quickly, and I'm also committed to delivering the results. If you think you cannot do it, just say, I am handicapped. I can do this portion of it. Can somebody work with me? So that is an honest conversation. When you have that honest conversation, people know where you are for, you know, and what are your capabilities. That will lead to your good teamwork. People will know. Um, unified commitment. Um, you know, that is, everybody agrees to the same thing. A collaborative climate. You know, if somebody is lagging behind. It's just everybody should be just saying, is there anything we can do to help you? I know you're come, you know, you're lagging behind. You're about two days because they may have had some incidences. Whatever happened in their life, they did not get to spend the time. It is not about really forcing them to come. Like I said in the earlier, they should have that, but they can say, I can use some help so that we can get caught up. And people, if they pitch in, now the whole team pulls ahead very fast. Very, very important to do that. And uh, don't compromise on quality. It should be. You should set yourself high quality to really be, whether it is what you're writing, what analysis you're doing, what kind of judgment you're drawing. And if you're lagging behind and you are a little doubtful about your judgment, say, can somebody else take a look at this and then say, am I meeting our standards? Can we improve it? anything on it? And everybody should be willing to pitch in. Because you can quickly read somebody's and then say, I could have done it a little bit better, or I think there are some things missing. So the whole team benefits from it. Um, principled leadership. You know, you are sort of a self-directed team. That means there is no somebody who has been appointed as the leader because, you know, you have two horns on your head or whatever. If it's in a big organization, somebody by position, they have a leadership role. You're a self-directed team. That means you choose your own leader. And what is important in a leadership is Again, many of these qualities, if somebody is lagging behind, you will be pitching in. Every one of you is going to be a leader. And yet, at times, you need to be really having 
somebody just say, why not we go this? If you felt among yourself after you're working, this person is pulling a little bit more on behalf of everybody. He's got the right kind of qualities, or she's got the right kind of qualities. Why not we just designate her? If you cannot, that's OK. Everybody's the leader, that's fine. But if you can, that's also equally good. Last one. Um, you can move on and just get into the last one. That's the last one. You know, this is one chart that you can use for your entire life whenever you're working or you're doing anything. Whether it be, you know, putting a party together at home or working in your company or doing any kind of a public service project, it doesn't matter. This is about how you really work as a team. Every time when you meet as a team or when you meet time as a team, doesn't matter. You need to really set what your goals are for that meeting. You have to be very clear. We are here. Why are we here? You need to be very clear. I got to have, we're going to accomplish one, two, three, whatever it is. You're not going to solve world hunger on one day. You're going to just to solve on that day, how am I getting this bag of rice to that team? That's fine. That may be what you're talking about. Something simple that you're planning to accomplish that day. So be very clear what the goals are. And then roles. You know, when I say roles, it is <clears throat> everybody in the team has got a little different role. For example, these three people worked on that particular topic, so they are going to share their ideas. The rest of us are going to give a feedback. We are going to take that and incorporate into what we are doing. Those are all roles for that day's meeting. So it becomes everybody knows how are we taking the information so that we can get to that goal. Process. Process has got decision making, problem solving, communication. So how you run the meeting. Let us say you're going to talk about a topic on that day, which is about, let us say possibly, there are different solutions for whatever you have identified as a problem. You know, she talked about taking all this weather forecast and coming up back and up with something. That's what you're going to do on that day. So the goal is we are going to come back with a solution or possible two or three solutions for how do we tackle this weather-related data to the plant. I'm just making it up as I go. So some people would have just said, hey, that's what we're going to talk about next class, next time. Why don't you do research on this, on whether what is data available, somebody just said, what is currently the plant is accessing, each one has that. And when you come in, you're going to say, why don't you share? That may be that theirs is about sharing. The process by which you're going to go through is, what am I going to do first? What am I going to do next? And then third. So first may be, OK, you, 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 go ahead and then tell us about what you learned. Share that with everybody. And that is part of the process. That's the communication part. Everybody shares that. And then there is a time to ask questions. And then there is a time to debate which way we are going to go through. And then, so you're writing that. So much time for sharing information, so much for asking questions, so much for debating. And then comes a decision making. Decision making is very important. You have to really think through. Is it going to be <coughs> by consensus? Is it going to be by majority? Or is it going to be one person is going to just say, listen, I've heard enough. We're going in this direction. Any one of them that you decide is the way you're going to make decisions. And that can be different from one meeting to another. It doesn't have to be the same. But it is very important. Or else people will be talking around. Somebody will just say, no, I think we're going this way. And then somebody says, who the hell are you? Why should we go that way? I think we should go this way. And you will never get anywhere. And you'll have wasted a lot of time. So talk about this ahead of time. For this meeting, who's going to be? Or is it going to be by consensus? Okay? And then comes interpersonal. This is the one that makes teams more successful or not successful. Let's say we take two people. Nothing against each you two. But let us say you are a person who likes to stay at the high level. And he is a person who would really like to get into the details. So the discussion is going where they're saying we have this solution, that solution. And you said, that's good. No, I don't need any more details. I'm happy with that. And I said, I don't understand. Now, you need to tell me to the ultimate level of detail. And then you are just saying, God Almighty, why won't he shut up? 
so that we can get on with it. And this will happen all the time. Some people would like to pontificate forever and ever, and others would just like to keep it very cryptic. Two people like that, perfectly okay. But if you understood that that's the characteristic of him, and that is your characteristic, then he asks that you can say, Joe, I know you would like to let you know, get detailed. We have just about 10 minutes. We gotta get somewhere. So would you mind if I briefed you outside the room? Bear with us, trust us, we'll get on with it. And you should be, the other person who is very detail-oriented should have the magnanimity to say, it's team success that is important, let us get on. And last say you're discussing in detail because you have to get into the detail to make a decision. And you just say, God, I cannot stand this. Why are we just waddling in the mud? You no, know, let's get on with the you know, high-level stuff. But one should have, I know that's your thing, you cannot, if you want to, you can take a break or you can come back. We need to let, get to this level unless or else we cannot make a decision. Somebody has to explain. That is your characteristic and that is yours. And, but we recognize that's how you are. We cannot change it. But for the team to be successful, let's just move on. Recognize it and then move on. That kind of thing is so critical in this one. And uh, that's what leads to conflicts many times. And if you just understood why conflicts are coming, why people behave differently, it's a lot easier to work. You would be amazed doing this. When first one of my friends you know, started this, I just couldn't stand it. He would say, so what's the grippy now? What's the goal? I said, we are meeting for 10 minutes. And you want a grippy? He says, yeah, I think we should do it. I would just feel like you know, choking the guy. <laughs> because he's just so difficult to deal with. But after going through this for, you know, a year, two years, working with the same guy, finally you understood, oh, this is such a neat thing. If you just do that in five seconds, it's just, uh, you know, what's the goal? So what, why are we meeting? Somebody just says that and somebody else, pretty soon you know what, why, why are we meeting. Because then you know whether you accomplish what you wanted to. Not going to be easy, but this will be a lifelong benefit to you, you know, practicing this. So with that, uh, that's what I had. All these slides are there. Uh, but before we go on, may I just to say a few things about what uh, that lady said? Yeah. And a little bit about that project. Carol, yeah, okay. please. Carol's project. So I don't know whether you, you sent that email that she sent, which is all the things that they go through. You have all had a chance to read it, or you have had a chance to read it? So if you really look at what she has given you, it just tells you about the phases that a plant goes through for handling any kind of a, you know, adverse event like a hurricane. Use hurricane as an example. So she just said, I need to know, the, there's, in the first phase is, before I start doing anything I need to analyze, do I need to do anything? That's, you know, the first phase. And after that, they go through every one of them. In fact, there's one phase where you're riding through the storm. And then there is a phase when, how do you recover from the storm? The first one is, how do I know that I have to do something? Second phase for, how do I get ready for the storm? And then how do I ride through the storm? And then how do I recover from the storm? In all these phases, those may be your high level boxes. That's one way to slice the pie. Another way to slice the pie is what she told you. She says, you know, in riding through the storm, I think we have information. In something, in, in another one, we have something information. I don't need help there. I think where the, the thing is broken a little bit more is how do we just, it cuts across. Once I know that the storm is coming, how do I know, do I have enough information to really make a decision about getting ready? Yes, I'm going to pull the trigger and we are going to be, it is on a storm preparedness. That portion, she says, I have. It is very iffy. Now think about why that is iffy. If it is inside the plant, they are in total control, other than the uncertainty from the outside. They have already worked on it quite a bit. Whereas the outside one, there is a lot of uncertainty. Because they don't know when the storm, when they say the storm is coming, they have <coughs> not analyzed enough to say, is it at a level where four days later it's going to hit us? 
because it says it's going to hit us and then it just curves around and it goes away. Have I already pulled the trigger too early? Because if I pull the trigger too early, there's something that is happening. So the uncertainty, which is what goes back to DNVGL's statement on risk, have I taken an extra risk? There are two kinds of risks. I'm taking the risk where it is one of getting ready. If you are not ready, it's the even a bigger risk. Because when it happens, you are not ready at all. You are scrambling, something is going to be missing, and so on. So that is the first one that she says. Later on, she's also talked about the second one. When people have to leave, she says, we don't have enough information either to get them out or bring them back in. So that is, look at the uncertainty. They cannot control that, where water is, where transportation facilities are not available. And that's what he says is another important challenge for them. They can handle everything inside. So it's a very nice way she has identified two problems. And you can easily empathize with what they're saying because they cannot get their hands around both those problems. So can you just put something around a little bit more in terms of information? And the nice thing is, this is your playing field. Apps, this, that, and just imagine, whenever you guys are going, and I've seen this with many of you, and Aparajita knows because I've worked, you know, she is my, she works with me as a TA. Um, you guys can use your, you know, cell phone, and uh, we are just driving around, and then it's just, says, no, 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 take that road, and then pretty soon you're driving somewhere else, because you've already figured out using whatever latest information is to travel around. You guys think 10 times faster than traditional ways of people, how they think. That's one of the reasons why DNBGL was wanting you to do this project. Because your way of thinking about things is going to be so different than you know, our generation or the current generation that is operating the plants. Because we never, you know, we did not grow up with the level of sophistication that these tools are available. Correct. For you, that's a way of life. That's how you think about it all the time. So it comes to you naturally. So yeah. excellent, two excellent projects they have given. And, and uh, also, Philip 66, if you combine the two uh, presentations, I think if you see, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, today, uh, what oh, Mr. Opdom was saying was, uh, see, it takes seven days if they have to, you know, shut down the plant. And as uh, Radha mentioned, if it's too early, not good. Or get too late, it's really bad. <coughs> so I think, and even to bring it up again, it's, I think there may be somewhere in between. And while all this is happening, the communication as well as the going and going out, there may be something. Now combine that, now add to what these two people have told us from the plants, to what DNVGL has been saying. So they got that chart saying that, you know, you have a, you know, a recovery, you know, repair, recovery, and back to functionality. So there are a lot of tools available. Now, I leave it at that, and I think one thing I wanted to talk about is that the, the teams and, you know, to put this project together, I think quite frankly, I think this I've seen it already in action with Dr. Radha and some of the team members here. So to pull these two uh, uh, companies was not easy. But for them to, you know, to convince them to come here, was they, I didn't have to do much. Once they agreed, they came here and the lady was going on a movie. But she's absolutely, but after she, they all agreed that we'll all kind of work in a collaborative manner. And it's very important that they want to see you succeed in this. She sends me a note. Please tell them we are excited to partner with them and have fun have fun with them. So in other words, you can ask the questions as Radha was saying. Go ahead and disturb the questions, organize along these lines. Be now you are at a point, you had about five weeks at the most. So you got to have the roles and responses, problem defined, and we'll go meet with the people. Now you've seen the plan, you've talked about they talked about the plans. Now you can go into a little bit higher gear. 
So it's already you guys are probably you know turned out already. <laughs> you know about you know right correct.